Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Tookie's Take Podcast. I am Tookie, joined here once again by the, the guys, the fellas. It's us. We're here with Endo, and we are here with one sin for the win. A day late, but not a dollar short, as we move from our normal Monday, Thursday, back to a Tuesday, Friday for this week. So thanks for sticking with us. Of course, this Thursday, it's Thanksgiving in the United States. So we had to kind of work around that. But yeah, hey, two shows this week. We are sticking with it. We're back here again to talk about everything that's gone down over the past couple of days in the hockey world, as we always do. But before we get down to that, of course, we do have to say a special hello to our friends at Manscaped, who have continued to sponsor the show up to the holiday season, and we thank them for that. Of course, the typical deal applies of using code Tugi at checkout for 20% off your order and free worldwide shipping, but as well. Well, it's worth noting that there is a Black Friday deal, a Cyber Monday deal, site-wide sale, 25% off there. So, man, if you were ever going to check out our friends at Manscaped, now is the time. They have some new products that have dropped recently that we've been able to kind of test out that we'll start giving some reviews on sooner rather than later, which is fantastic. I know Endo very much approves of the, uh, what was it, was the shampoo and body wash or just the outright shampoo? Uh, the body wash, um, unfortunately, because I have textured hair, or as we like to call it in the black community, black people hair, I can't use the, um, the two-in-one, but I will be giving that to my, uh, my, my, uh, my dad to give it a try, because he's Italian, I think he can, I think he can use it more than I can, but the body wash is endo approved and it is girlfriend uh, approved. Polina approves completely. It, it's got approval yeah, from yeah. a Russian. They're really, they're really strict. It's perfect. Absolutely great scent. It's not too strong. It's just a little bit nice little touch to it. I'm like a sommelier, but for body wash. <laughs> the shampoo sommelier. The <laughs> new episode. That's our first episode title of the day. We will see. Uh, if you muted it, yourself. Uh, you muted yourself. <laughs> well, we'll see if it sticks. I would have been muted for you guys, not for me. I was oh, typing okay. something out. It's perfectly fine. Manscaped.com. <laughs> All your grooming needs. You know the deal by now. With that said, we want to get down to business today. Make sure to get down to your business at Manscaped. We want to get down to business today with some viewer questions because it's been a couple of days and it will be good to get going with this once more. So we will start off with our buddy Devs, who was surprisingly not asking a question about the New Jersey Devils, but wishing us a happy early Thanksgiving, a happy belated for one Endo Mills north oh. of the border. That was a month ago for you. You don't even remember it. It was a month ago. What the hell happened? Um, but the question applies, I'd say to all three of us. What dishes do you bring slash usually make for your Thanksgiving meal? Now, if you're not somebody that does that, eh, just say your favorite thing. But uh, yeah, sin, Thanksgiving, what's the go-to? Yeah, I don't bring shit. I bring my charm, <laughs> my wit, my jokes, and my uh, occasional N64 so all the cousins can play Mario Party. Um, yeah. <laughs> just, we like to reminisce like that sometimes, but less so, you know, now that uh, they got kids and stuff. A bunch of responsible people having to look after other humans. But uh, for me, man, I, I look forward to pumpkin pie a lot oh my I god i do not yes. eat sweets i i really don't eat sweets um throughout the course of my entire year thanksgiving and christmas is the time when i eat so many sweets i just hate myself afterwards and it's it's <laughs> terrific it's it's a great feeling see i love that um and uh garlic mashed potatoes Ooh. and i and i i always claim off the turkey the drumstick that's my go-to <laughs> there you go. So I guess that's a what few about dishes, but hey. <laughs> oh man, uh, for me, uh, I usually just eat everything. Uh, I am like a human vacuum. Um, if anyone is aware of like Tuki streams and how I constantly ask for food, and it's always burger. Uh, whatever, whenever it's Thanksgiving, it's usually just like, just give me like a whole bunch of like white meat. Give me some stuffing. Give me. I, I'm not. I haven't really been a big fan of cranberry sauce. Or whatever their sauces uh, like that. I don't know. It just it just wasn't for me. And like like since said pumpkin pie. I don't know what it was, but I never liked pumpkin pie until I was like fourteen. It's it's a, it, like I don't understand like the age, but like right there's like I guess my taste perceptors or my taste buds were still developing, 
and then just like oh pumpkin pie oh yeah sweet put that like right in my bloodstream completely it's great fair enough there's not too much that i i don't like i'm like sin i'm not the biggest fan of sweets like aside from like oh it's summer i'll have ice cream like once a week tops or something <laughs> like that i'm not uh the biggest fan of sweets throughout the year so yeah i mean the the pie game has to be mm-hmm. has to be strong during thanksgiving i'm also someone by the way where it's just like i just kind of go and bring my bring bring myself um i'll help out once i'm there though yeah me too. um I am bring real. Charcuterie board. i'll bring some salami and cheese that's easy <laughs> there you go just buy that girlfriend shit. and i just did that yeah. this weekend we went and met up with a bunch of friends and we're just like let's let's bring the meats and the cheeses and oh that's the way to go okay and I, they always bring um, a bottle of wine then um uh, if anyone in, in Ontario knows, um, in a scaling, they have a bottle. It's late autumn Riesling. It's like a nice light wine. Um, this is like a, when I was working at a wine store. This is like it's like a cheap retail wine store. This is the one wine I usually get. Give it a try. It's nice and light. Um, not too not too crazy. It's like nice and light and fruity. Goes well chilled. Yeah. There you go. Also a. Uh... <laughs> Shampoo and wine sommelier. An actual <laughs> sommelier. <laughs> might be too. <laughs> might be too. Uh, too long of a title. Uh, and the food. I mean, man, it's it's everything. I mean, turkey, potatoes, yeah. stuffing. It's just. It's the best. It's the best. Um, speaking of the best, next question comes from Hawks. Thoughts on Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and oh. Shining Pearl? I was wondering what the hell he meant by that because. Uh, Everything after Pokemon Red and Blue is actually not Pokemon, so sorry that I have Oof. to break that truth down for you right here. Shots fired at Yellow. Jesus. <laughs> well, I mean, Yellow, <laughs> Yellow's still Gen 1, so yeah. Fair. So for me, right, um, Pikachu and I, I've mentioned this too, I mean, Sin obviously hasn't played Pokemon in a while, and that's perfectly fine. I don't know what Endo's experience is with it either, um, but recently for me, I've gotten back into it. Like, I was into Pokemon up until, like, 2002. Because, yeah, it was like, okay, red, blue, green, yellow, and those are good. And then you got, or those are all timers, not just good. And then, like, gold and silver, they were solid. Then, like, Crystal came out on the Game Boy Advance, I think, and that was good. Crystal was on the Ruby and Sapphire. Yeah, there you go. So Ruby and Sapphire must have been the ones on Advance, and that's kind of where I cashed out for a long time. Because 2002, ah, because I was the coolest of kids, was right around the time that a show by the name of Yu-Gi-Oh! took off. And that was my next couple of years. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. My cousins had the whole, like, you know, the arm, like, thing you could, you could actually have? They had that. <laughs> and it was a pain in the ass because we'd fight. And it's like, okay, it's like, all right, I do, like, 200 life points. And it's just like, all right, hold on. Come on. Okay, who I know exactly. It was a full wrist accessory. Yeah. It was beautiful. Um, point being, I got back into Pokemon because on stream people are like, play it, play it, you gotta play it. So like two years ago, Sword and Shield came out. Those were pretty fun. Um, very casual, hand holdy though, but they were fun. Then these are remakes of Diamond and Pearl that came out in 2006, and it's good. I mean, it, it's still Pokemon at that point. Like, Obviously, there's still some things, but Sin, I feel like that... Like, Sin could pick up these two games and be like, oh, okay, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I could. Like, the formula is still the same. So, for that reason, I am enjoying it It's still a more complex version of Rock, Paper, Scissors. Like... Yeah. 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 That's that's perfect. And for me, it's just like, it's (laughs) overwhelming. Like, I'm just like, 150 is a good fucking number. Even Gold and Silver, I played a little bit. I'm like, ah, some of these new Pokemon are getting a little freaking corny. And I can't even imagine... chandelier? (laughs) Yeah, like, well, yeah, in, in, like, Gold and Silver, like, they had, I'm like, oh, cool, Nocturnal Pokemon, you know, Daytime Pokemon, they entered, you know, mm-hmm. did a whole day cycle in there, and then, but, like, after oh. that, I was, I'm seeing some of the designs coming out now, I'm just like, what the fuck is this, dude? One that's like, oh, that was you're be- stretching human imagination to the point that was, of, oh, yeah. you don't like pumpkin Pokemon? <laughs> you don't like the... That was the best part Wait, there's pumpkin of the two Pokemon? most recent games. That's oh, basically that's World Pokemon. of Warcraft. I have a when they enter when they put in their little stupid, uh, <laughs> basically Pokemon ripoff mini game inside of World of Warcraft. I had a little pumpkin dude who I got for like a Halloween <laughs> dungeon. I can't remember how I got him. He was a little fucker. Oh my god! <laughs> I wish <laughs> an angry Nintendo Jack-O-Lantern, essentially. <laughs> I wish Nintendo discounted their games because I would totally buy you one of the more recent Pokemon's just to get your reaction. In a, on a live stream of what some of the new ones look like. Oh my Give God. me a fucking but, reason to stream because NHL's giving me zero. 
Fair enough. That is, it's uh, dude. It's great. Like bottom line, like for I picked diamond over pearl, and uh, the starters are all the same. But I picked the water starter, which is a penguin, Pip-lop. and we named him Danny DeVito. That's my Let's boy. Go. Yeah. Oh my so. god! Did I tell you what, how I um how I found a random giant piplup, uh, on the street? No, no I didn't. I'm, I'm, like I'm a, pl- like a yeah, giant? No, like an actual piplup. No, pip-lop. like like a plushie on the street. So I was going to hockey one day. And I was going to work actually in the morning and I saw this like randomly like on the street. I'm like, ah, that's weird. Okay. I'll just keep going. And then like, I come back on my way back home at like 7 PM and it's still there. I'm like, I should give this a home. And then I, I just pick it up. I bring it inside the, the condo. Polina gets back and she's like, why is there a pip up in my bathtub? And I'm like, he, he want, he looked cold. <laughs> so I gave him the wash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I left yeah, on the balcony. Like, then he got shat on by copious amounts of birds because it was a bad area that we were living in. So uh, that piplup got shat on. <laughs> it's a bad area we're living in. Gangs of birds. Uh, <laughs> like like crack crackheads. Just what he said. Okay. Oh, but the, okay. But what's the relevance to that? To birds shitting on things? Uh, because the area was just terrible. It was like okay. it was my old place of residence. It was God. It was awful. We had to get that place fumigated like every every other month. It was gross. Sounds like New York. Well, speaking of Toronto, this next question is for Endo uh, exclusively. It comes from Nighthawk. What is the best rink in Toronto between Bill Bolton and George Bell Arena? I've played it both throughout my childhood, but I want to know your opinion. Okay. I know your top-notch rink in Toronto. Okay. So, uh, Bill Bolton is also where I grew up playing. I I grew up, like, not even, like, down the street from there. Uh, the, their arena is great. The The ice is okay. Uh, their changing rooms are smaller than, like, anything known to man. Um, I Like, one of their changing rooms is, like, I think about two times as big as my office. And that's not big. That's like maybe like like five endo T poses of like width and like ten of length. It, it, it's it's not that great. T po- posing as a measurement. Yeah. T posing as a measurement. We call that an NBA live. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh man, that was great. Or NBA Elite, whatever the hell they were gonna rename it to. Uh, oh, was it Elite? Yeah, Elite Oh Nine. Yeah. Was it the Bynum? Like, I yeah, think it was, was just T posing yeah. at center court. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best. Oh man, that killed the franchise. Uh, another thing, George Bell, great arena, great amenities. I think the best rink to play at right now is um what used to be maple leaf gardens which is now mad at me athletic center which is the home of the uh ryerson university rams absolute like nhl caliber ice uh it's a great great arena to play in best ice i play that though in toronto would probably be uh air canada center i've done a lot of skates there as a rental goalie because i go all over the place uh flex yeah uh, just a little just a little flex um, worst rink in the worst rink in the city is I think I mentioned them already Moss Park because of previous incidents with uh, tracking COVID and all that, and I basically freaked out because I could have gotten it and Polina could have gotten it. And she got sick. I'm like, great, that's great, that's perfect. But overall, then these I think um, best rink is Rico Coliseum Air Canada Center, but it's kind of biased because it's like an NHL arena. But like just normal arena in the city, probably um, mad at me. So our next question comes from Tyler. The worst third jerseys of all time. That's tough. In the NHL. Now, look, this is very much brought on by the fact that the New Jersey Devils officially unveiled their jersey jersey today. Now, I wanted to say this about that particular it's not jersey. That bad, but it's not great. It's not that bad. It's not. It's not. Is it great? No. But compared to some of the worst third jerseys that have been out there, it's not that bad, right? I mean, there have been some god-awful third jerseys out there. Do you remember the Buffalo Sabres yellow-gray monstrosity from, like, 2013, 2014? There have been a lot of of bad (laughs) alternates, and, I mean, we could sit here and go through a lot of the teams and say, like, oh, yeah, no, that jersey is absolutely atrocious. But to that point, 
There are a lot of jerseys. Shout out to the Vegas Golden Knights, by the way, who have the worst third jersey in the league. I'm talking about the yellow one. Vegas high um, rollers, I'm telling you. Yeah, they literally God. picked one of the worst alternates in history, which coincidentally is now Nashville's home jersey, and <laughs> made it more obnoxious because they're Vegas. They need to be a center of attention for fucking everything. That and took me a second. With the gold ass helmet, like, oh my God. What is that? It's gross. Oh my God. I remember back the in the New Jersey yeah. third jersey. In my opinion, is an okay to maybe bad jersey that people are memeing because yeah. it says jersey and then helmet says helmet. But this is a jersey that will turn a corner. And this will become a jersey that in as little as a year, if not three to five, people will be like, oh yeah, I actually kind of like that jersey. Mm -hmm. And it'll become a little bit of a collector's item. Yeah. So I am jumping on that bandwagon early as to where I don't see this jersey as being all that bad. Because the opinion on it will change. It will become a sought-after jersey once all the memeing is done. And I think that this was a brilliant move on New Jersey's part. Now, whether or not you want to say they're shifting blame onto Martin Brodeur or not is what it is, which I think is hilarious. But... A normal third jersey. How much is that going to get talked about? The LA Kings, for example, one of our other questions here, the one immediately afterwards was from Z-Pops asking, what is the best third jersey right now? And one of my votes would be for the LA Kings third jersey, the one that they have the chrome helmets for. But if you look at that third jersey itself... It's exactly like their second. It is, which is why I like it, but it has the old Gretzky era logo on it. But I think that's a very good jersey. How much did people talk about that jersey? I didn't even. One night, I wasn't even aware of it, and they're in my division. Yeah, Until one night, maybe two nights when they actually wore it, <laughs> like when it was unveiled, and then when they wore it. That's the only time it was mentioned. This Devils jersey has been talked about for a couple of days, and it's hey, it exploded when they announced it. It'll explode again when they wear it. I think this was, in a way, a good thing for the Devils, intentional or not. Unveiling a jersey that's kind of meh, but it's getting people to talk about it. And from a marketing perspective, while it might not equate to buys, the potential's there because more people are going to see this jersey. I think this was a stroke of marketing genius, whether intentional or not. It really is. And simply, I think it's just, it's just different. And that's why, that's why I think it is genius, because they are willing to go there take the risk where it could go off well or it could be memed to death. Either way, it's a good thing because, like you said, you get people talking about it. The memes will subside after a while as, as long as, you know, you don't just they they're, they won't succumb to the pressure. They're not going to get rid of it, like, at all, and they shouldn't because, yeah, like you said, I'm actually hoping people hate it and it doesn't get a lot of buys and then may, eventually they stop making it because I want to get my per, perhaps my hands on one just so... I, like you said, I really think it could become something that people look back on and be like, this wasn't that bad. Like, look at the price on eBay or from other sellers of jerseys that were known to be trash. They're not cheap. They're not cheap. And I think this will be another one of those instances. Um, that said, in terms of Z-Pop's question about some of the best thirds, again, I do like that Kings jersey. The Winnipeg Jets third jersey. Uh, the primarily blue one with, like, the red and white striping, I think is just, mwah. like, that should be, I own one, I, li I literally, for those watching on the YouTube side of things, the sleeve is in your frame, because I'm not taking it off the rack, but it's, it, that one's delightful, um, I gotta be honest, I always like the Sharks and their, their black alternate for a third jersey, I always think they do that very, very well, uh, and then the Columbus Blue Jackets, uh, with that blue alternate. Some people are saying it's reached the point where it's been overhyped, but those are some of my favorites. And Anaheim's uh, orange alternate, because they use the proper logo that the Ducks should use. They, they what's that? Oh, I, I don't know if, I don't know what it was, but I, I wear it on my World of Chell dude for the random times where I play drop. It's like the kind of tealish uh, with that old logo on it. Was that the reverse? It wasn't the reverse retro, was it? Because that was the stupid one with like the cartoon on it. Um, um It was God, some form of... Yeah, it was like some form of alternate. Like it wasn't the purple and teal, but it had like, uh, I, I, it's it's a great fucking jersey. And oh, like the black one with the teal on mm, the shoulders and at the bottom. No, no. no, it wasn't black. I huh. don't think. I don't know. I'll have to. 
I'll have to pull, I'll, I'll send you guys a picture when I pull it up later. Um, yeah, anyway, well. it's 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 great. Yeah, I would say my favorite current jersey, honestly. And um, as for thirds, I feel like there's not a great selection this year. Uh, first of all, Canucks is well compared awful. to last year where there was a thousand reverse yeah, retros. Canucks yeah. is just absolutely awful. I hate that. Old, I don't. I hate that stupid logo. The square with a goddamn hockey stick in it doesn't look hockey. like a C. Um. I like the Dallas Stars. I'm not a fan of the stick and ring guy. I'm going to say it. I love the Dallas Stars because you know why? They went with neon and they said, fuck what you think. And they did it. I think it's great. And I don't I don't hate that. Jer- like At first, I, I wasn't a big fan of that jersey. I wasn't a big fan of Tampa's. But in a way, like different, I'm okay with different mm-hmm. in a way. Maybe that's why I don't mind the jersey one, although people are saying it's not that different. Uh, you know, They'll bring up like the Chicago Winter Classic jersey. But I get what you mean about the Dallas jersey. Yeah, I think we should stop... With this whole tradition thing. That's what is holding hockey back in so many goddamn ways. From the culture of it to, uh, you know, moving in the the right direction game-wise. It's like, it's still, like, it honestly, it starts with stuff like this. And people just going outside the box because it seems trivial. And it's, oh, it's just a jersey at the end of the day. It's not, though, because it's getting people to just stop being, like, so married to these, like, normal things that happen, like, Eventually, I want the Sharks to stop with the black alternates just because it's become such a thing. They've been doing it since like the mid 2000s. Like, you could be doing other stuff like with the older logo and whatnot. But yeah, I just, I really like it because it's completely different. They they went with a black, which they haven't had a ton of um, on their jerseys, really, like the outlines and stuff like that, some of the accents. But then, like this neon green. And again, I feel like it was in, in the same kind of vein as the, uh, the jersey thing when it just, it's going to be received. Two different ways. Either people are going to love it or people are going to, you know, make fun of it. And I, I saw it, you know, uh, Tony X was calling it, you know, the, the laser tag jersey on Twitter last night. And it's <laughs> that's funny as hell. Yeah, it, it looks like a glow in the dark thing. But, yeah, I just hmm. I really dig it because it re- also reminds me of these those uh, oil kings uh, or is it the oil kings on the WHL? They yeah. had those yeah. alternates like black and neon green. That was a dope yep. jersey. Uh, exactly when you, when you can change about. the jerseys. Uh, and choose your jerseys in uh, Ishil back in like, God, that was old. That was a while ago when you could still choose your jerseys. Your 14 era. Stuff yeah. Like that. <laughs> that, I would always, always go with those. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I'm going to keep mine very, very simple. Honestly, I really actually do like the jersey, uh, the new the jersey, the new jersey, jersey. Uh, the jersey alt. jersey. Yeah, the jersey jersey alt. Um, I like, I don't know what it is, but the back of it just looks super clean. With having the red accent on there, just not too much of the red. I do think that if it just said new, like where the jersey, where it says jersey on the front, like if it was just a, a little small little font of new, it would be a lot better of a uniform. Uh, uh, as for the other uniforms, I really like Colorado's alt, which was their winter classic jersey at one point, and they changed it to their being their third jersey. That's the one I really like. I like when teams make hit the mark with an alternate jersey of via like an event like winter classic stadium series and they go you know what we kind of like this we're gonna make this like a full-time kind of thing and it props to them uh another one too is uh, uh carolina's um storm Sur- storm surge uh black uh, alternate and i think another one that rounded out for third one would be the washington's uh w as well the w yeah the w it's just so clean like just on like a like a design perspective it's just clean i really uh, don't like the colors you don't like them no i don't know i i don't feel like that blue meshes with that red i don't know what it is it just it my eyes it's jarring to my eyes right uh honorable mention not in the nhl but the moose jaw warriors of whl have the nicest uniform that have the nicest logo with color combination because i believe they recently changed it so where it's like instead of it being um uh a depiction of i think it's a depiction of a native person uh like a like an etched out kind of like 2d kind of drawing it is like an actual like moose and just the way it's designed and the way the jersey looks the red ones look so clean um it, yeah, I think that and the uh, the Portland Winter Hawks logo redesign went over pretty well too. Oh yeah, you mean Homeland Esports? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
We'll move on. Uh, next question here. These will kind of keep us in the uh, the realm of hockey. This comes from Ender. Looking at goal differential, are teams like Toronto and the New York Rangers going to fall off, or will they keep finding ways to win despite barely scoring more than they allow? Um, I'll mention this. Right now in the NHL, the team with the highest goal differential is Calgary at a plus 27, and the worst, surprise, surprise, is Arizona at a minus 35. Uh <laughs> Jesus. The new- oh, my God. <laughs> Keep in mind, they've played 19 games, and they oh, have them 34 boy. goals for 69 against. Nice. Jesus. Uh, so the Rangers right now are even. 51 goals for 51 against. And the Leafs are at a plus 6. 51 for and 45 against. Jeez. Uh, the to Rangers be honest, are even. I, wow. Yeah, I don't really see the Leafs as being in all that bad of a spot. Like... Minnesota has a plus five. Tampa and Boston both have plus three. Pittsburgh has a plus two. Like, I feel like, you know, they're okay. Vegas is at an even with all their injuries. I don't view that as anything to worry about. The Rangers at an even I is worry about that. probably, yeah, it's a little bit concerning. Um, Especially because the record's pretty good. So you just have to think that's not sustainable, that record. With yeah, that they're 11, 4, and 3. Not sustainable. And they have an even. Yeah. yeah they're fucked. Unless they get that going. Which is... Along lines of along the lines of Nashville, who also have an even record, so it, I, I view I view the Rangers as a team to probably worry a little bit more about, uh, in regards to looking at goal differential, uh, if not for the sole purpose that man I look at that Rangers team and I still I still question their depth, whereas for the Leafs are their depth questions yes, but I think they have. Uh, more tools than the Rangers do at this point. Yeah, it's just that can the Leafs ever get them going at the same time, which has not been the case yet, but hey, maybe this is the year. <laughs> I feel like uh, <laughs> it's Groundhog Day again, but uh, yeah, For maybe, those maybe not watching the video portion again, <laughs> just search Dignity Steak Podcast and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, our final question comes from, and I believe this is Nadelkovic better than Demko Stan, uh, which is a hell of a name. If the trade deadline was today, what what team would be buying and what team would be selling? Now, I have a feeling more than one team would buy or sell. Um, that said, I mean, you can pretty much look at the standings, right? To be like, okay, which teams would be buyers? Which teams would be sellers? I mean, the top 10 in the NHL right now, um, Carolina, Florida, Washington, Calgary, Toronto, Edmonton, Rangers, Tampa, Minnesota. Yeah, all of them probably buy or at least look at doing something. The only team in the top 10 that I'm like, eh, probably not is Anaheim. And that's just because they're still riding a hot streak. But the teams that would probably sell, Ottawa, bottom of the league right now, they'd probably sell. Arizona, Seattle, Montreal, Vancouver, Chicago, Buffalo. Like, for the most part, I mean, the Islanders are kind of the one exception there where it's like, I don't know what the hell is going on there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I mean, I, I feel like it was it would just kind of go the way you would expect it would. You know, top teams would likely look at buying and the bottom teams would likely look at selling and... You know, it's funny because you can look at the standings right now, and for a lot of these teams, you're like, yeah, I expect you to be right around where you are by the end of the season, or at least by the trade deadline. I don't really expect too much to change there. Carolina's going to be towards the top of the standings, as are the Panthers. Meanwhile, uh, the Sens, Coyotes, and probably the Kraken, Montreal as well, maybe they're going to be towards the bottom. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I guess he's trying to look for if, like, if it was today... I... Like, if there's a team that is maybe in a playoff spot that doesn't necessarily deserve to be. But that's, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of an interesting question to try to answer. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, especially, too, if it's the concept of, like, oh, well, what does a, a team that would buy, like, what does Carolina specifically need? Obviously, that would require way more yeah. research, and we can discuss that. I can't really think of a whole <laughs> lot that Carolina needs. Uh, for Auntie Ranta to stay the hell in his crease, but I don't know if you yeah. can buy that at the deadline. Yeah, That's a, really. a new goalie coach. Jeez. Oh man, I could I could go I, off about that. I know the Holy. Sharks are trying to sell. They have uh, put it out there that they're willing to uh, retain on Evander Kane. Ooh, I've which, heard some rumors um, about that. Which is ah, Tampa Bay, huh? Without a uh, certain star player that we'll mention again here in a little bit when yeah. we talk about them. Boy, wouldn't Tampa be nice? They got some cap space. Yeah. In fairness, it's not as long of an injury, but I don't know. I'm intrigued because uh, those what 21 games without a Vander Kane, we've almost hit that, haven't we? How We're many getting games close. The yeah, it's like year? 10 more days or something like that till he's up. Uh, 
or something like that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm as the closer it gets, the more kind of nerve wracking I'm getting. Cause I'm watching hurdle start to heat up and God, he's just so goddamn good. And it's like either he's either going to be gone or he's not. And a lot of that is going to depend on what the hell happens with the banner Kane. So I really need the, I don't know. Like I'm just trying to think of options. Like if you can't trade him, you don't want to buy his ass out. That that the cat the penalties was was like horrible. It was like three point two the first year, two point three the second year, and like a mil, almost yeah. two mil for like five or four year more years after that. Like that's horrible. Mm-hmm. You already have Martin Jones, you know, being bought out, and yeah, the Sharks are uh, a little screwed. Yeah, we'll keep following that as the season goes along. I think that's uh, that's for the best, yeah. but. Uh, again, hey, well, thank you all for bringing in your uh, your questions. Of course, again, Tukey24 on Twitter on podcast days, which, again, are typically Monday and Thursday. There will be a thread up this Friday, though, again, because of the holiday. And, as always, up on the uh, Discord as well in the podcast questions section. We have enough to talk about today that I wanted to keep it kind of brief with the podcast questions, and even then we just kind of kept going. But uh, we need to get into kind of the day-by-day to talk about everything that's gone on around the league since we last had a show this past Thursday. So we will bring us back to Thursday night, which again, feels like forever ago. And I want to start off by mentioning that the Calgary Flames beat the Buffalo Sabres 5 to nothing. It featured another Jacob Markstrom shutout. Johnny Goodrow scored his 5th and 6th, Mangiapane his 11th and 12th, and Matthew Kachuk his 8th. We will sum it up in short and saying ridiculous, because we have more stats to talk about with Calgary in a little bit. Also on Thursday, the Toronto Maple Leafs beat the New York Rangers 2-1. to one. Morgan Riley scored each of the goals there. Endo, do you have any thoughts from that particular game that's still, uh, still lingering around? Oh man, I can't even remember that game. But Morgan getting two of those both goals after having a very, very slow start and being now like still like the first defense in the in the Leafs to score. Um I I think it, the, the 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 wheels are starting to turn a little bit more. And I think they're finally getting back on track. But then we'll talk about how they got shut out against the pens uh, in a little bit. <laughs> So as I say yeah, that, uh, up until that day, up until that game, it's like, oh, things are going great. But, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins beat the Montreal Canadiens six to nothing <laughs> last Thursday. <laughs> Uh, Tristan Jari got a shutout. Don't worry, Penns fans will talk about him. Sidney Crosby scored his first of the year in that game. I believe that was his fifth game of the season. Uh, Heinen his fifth. Jake Gensel his sixth. Teddy Bluger had a two-goal game to move up to five goals as well. Because, of course, the Penguins would have four or five goals out of Heinen, Bluger, McGinn. You know, of course, their, their secondary scoring, despite some of their injury and COVID concerns, has not slowed down. Uh, nor have the Florida Panthers. They beat the Devils 4-1. to one. Uh, Again, you look at some of like the goal totals here. Verhage on 5, Luas Dorainen on 6, Huberto on 6, Duclair on 9. So pissed. Anthony Duclair. He, he finally found his home, and I'm happy for him. I mean, I think we've mentioned that He's on the show a couple of times. He's been this good. Recently. I don't get it. I don't get why teams weren't throwing money at him. Like, it's been there. I, I, I whatever. All right. I'm, I have a, I have a fun up. game. I have a fun game for you then, Sin. Anthony Duclair. Can you name every team Anthony Duclair has played an NHL game for? Oh, man. Probably not. Okay. Arizona. Or maybe yes. it was Phoenix at the time. I don't even know. No, it was Arizona. Arizona. Uh, Columbus. Correct. 53 games as a Blue Jacket. Uh-huh. Um, Ottawa. Correct. Right. Um, I'm missing something. Am I? Well, right now. All right. You are. You're missing one. No, he's missing two. Yeah. What? The one he, hold on, hold on. team he plays for and so, there's one more. Win- well, no. Was he no. in Winnipeg for a brief amount of time? No. No. Shit. So you said Arizona. Uh-huh. You said Columbus. Yes. You said Ottawa. Oh. And obviously Florida. Oh, sh- was he in Chicago? Hey, yeah, there Chicago. you go. That's a tough one. There you go. He played one. 23 games as a hot. I'm missing one other besides obviously the You're last one. You're missing the team he was drafted by. Oh, what? He wasn't drafted. 2013, third round, 80th overall. Washington? Who was Anthony? 
who was no, not Washington. Who was Duclair drafted by? He only played 18 games for the club. Huh. It's e- it's very easy to to forget if I'm being honest. I I yeah, I I completely thought he was just drafted by Arizona. What the hell? There were three picks by this team in this third round. I'm going to look this up. I'm not going to say the answer, though. They took Adam Tambellini, who never <laughs> played the NHL game. And then this other guy would be the dead giveaway. Yeah. Are you waving the white flag? Oh, oh wow. Fucking what? Yeah, it's one of those where you're like, oh, shit, it's that team. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess. Wh- they also took Pavel Bushnevich. Oh, Oh, the Rangers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, it's tricky. Like Arizona, you're like, oh, yeah, Ottawa, Columbus. But then like Chicago and the fact he was even drafted by the Rangers, all of these teams passed on him. And at this point, uh, just to do a little bit of quick maths here, 61 games played for Duclair as a Panther, 48 points. It's pretty good. I mean, again, like if you if you factor that into an eighty two game season, he's on a sixty four point pace yeah. as a Panther. I for eighty two game season. I I don't. I was so mad. I was like just trying to will the Sharks to sign him because he was going for cheap. What's his contract right now? It's probably a little bit better than when he signed it's, for like a million, <laughs> but it's probably <laughs> all right. Low. Let's, let's do this too. The the Anthony. Well, we won't do the full quiz, but uh, the Anthony Duclair contract history is also. Um, I know he signed in Ottawa for like a one by one or something like that. Insane. So, uh, in terms of his deals, he had his DLC obviously with the Rangers. Yeah. As a Coyote, one year deal worth one point two, so dirt cheap. Yeah. As a Blue Jacket, one year deal for six hundred and fifty k. That was for the eighteen yep. nineteen season. And he was started out pretty good there. I think he was on pace <clears> for then, twenty at one point. The next year, nineteen twenty, he signed a one year deal at one six five. For the Sens. And then last year for the Panthers, one year at 1.7. What the fuck? How is he not? He is now on a three-year, $3 million deal with the Panthers. Even that, Still. only $3 million bucks for a 60-point base player. Still, it's insane. Like, he, how hmm? was he getting? He represented himself this last time, didn't he? I think I read Maybe that Maybe something like that. He represented yeah, that himself. sounds familiar. I don't fucking blame him after getting those shit contracts, after continuously showing that he was a good player. I don't. I don't mm. understand this league. How like how did he continue to get like kind of shafted and be bounced around all all crazy? Whereas Galchenya keeps getting chance after chance after fucking chance, and finally he's getting paid dirt. But I mean, for so long teams kept taking these swings on Galchenya when he never really like he he was declining. Duclair has only been going getting better, and I, I don't understand why my teams weren't trying to. I don't know. Whatever. This is why when I roster it in NHL 20 or NHL 22 or whatever, and people are like, oh, aren't you worried about unrealistic contracts? No, the NHL is full of unrealistic mm-hmm. contracts of guys who are drastically overpaid or drastically underpaid. So, no, I'm not worried about that at all. And Duclair is proof. Uh, for the Devils in that game, Hamilton scored his fifth of the year, by the way. Uh, also on Thursday, the Lightning beat the Flyers 4-3 in a shootout. Braden Point, his seventh. We'll talk more about him in a second. Uh, Stamkos, his ninth. Because, of course, Steven Stamkos is still great. Uh, Claude Giroux had a two-goal game at that point, though, six and seven on the year. Speaking of someone else uh, who is still greatly unappreciated. Like, Claude Giroux is still a phenomenal goddamn player in the NHL. And nobody gives him the respect that he deserves. Like, nobody. Because if I say Stamkos and Giroux, where are most people going to play Stamkos? Here, and then Giroux's somewhere below him. Whereas, oh, no. I mean, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that Claude Giroux equals Stamkos. I mean, Stamkos obviously has the cups now. But, like, Claude Giroux, in terms of, you know, how good of a player he is, like, people act like there's a gulf between, like, he and Stamkos. I don't get the Claude Giroux disrespect. I never did. It's all because they forgot his name at the draft, man. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for Thomas Harley, Harley Thomas of the Dallas Stars. He'll never get respect either. Um, also, Thursday, uh, the Blues beat the Sharks 4-1 uh, for the Blues. Saad had a two-goal game, 5-6 and six on the year. Shark Kairou game. scored his eighth. Uh, Jonathan Dolan scored the lone goal for the Sharks, though, his seventh of the year. Sin, any thoughts on that particular game? Yeah. If you recall it. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Sharks just... I mean, it was just one of the, they couldn't finish and they weren't even 
necessarily getting severely outplayed, but that started their uh, their very long, uh, almost 180 minutes of uh, not getting a single power play. Coincidental, I'm sure. Oh yeah, definitely. Especially it starts with the it starts with the Blues because you know we got away with a hand pass one time, and ever since then can't fucking can't give us any penalties against the Blues, especially. Uh, the Minnesota Wild beat the Dallas Stars 7-2 to two last Thursday. Uh, Pitlick, Kaprizov, both scoring their fourth of the year. Hartman, his eighth. Jamie Benn scored his fourth of the year for Dallas. But this game was overshadowed by a story uh, that came out afterwards that Dallas Stars forward and Minnesota native Riley Tufte uh, was scratched an hour before game time after he had spent all of his call-up money on tickets for his family to the point where Nick Bjugstad uh, had to help chip in to help make sure he could get his family to the game. And then they scratched him. Uh, now, it, the, the blame was originally on head coach Rick Bonus, and then it was on an assistant or whatever. The bottom line is, what a shit look. I, I mean, the Stars lost that game. It, they fell to 6-7-2 on the season. Last year was abysmal for them after the cup run the or the cup yeah the cup finals run at least obviously they didn't win but getting to the cup final the year before last year they were decimated by injuries and covid and now this year it's not a great start and then you have a story like this and even if it wasn't his call it's his staff and you have to wonder uh could Rick Bonus kind of be on the chopping block as one of the first uh, coaches axed this season if things continue to go poorly for Dallas because this is the type of move uh, that I think could easily lose a locker room, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it's just a horrible look. I mean, does he even have it at this point? Cle- I mean, the st- he's been coaching them since what year? Uh, 2020. So he took over as interim head coach. So first and foremost, Rick Bonus has been in hockey uh, for 10 years longer than I've oh, been yeah. alive. Yeah, he's, he's, he's uh, an old He was guy. an assistant coach with the original Winnipeg Jets uh, starting back in 1984. And Jesus. Did, wasn't he with Ottawa for their expansion? I believe I remember okay, hearing so him interviewed Okay, here we go. Let's that. run through Rick Bonus's history. <laughs> um, assistant coach of the Jets uh, from 84 to 87. Head coach of the Jets from 89 to 89. He lasted four months. <laughs> uh, he was head coach of the Bruins for 11 months between 91 and 92. Head coach of the Sens for three years. Associate and head coach with the Islanders for two years, assistant coach with the Coyotes, interim head coach with the Coyotes from uh, February 04 to August 05. Was, did he replace Gretzky? That's what I'm wondering. Is did he Was he the replacement for Gretzky, or did Gretzky come after him? Uh, he was with the Canucks, he was with the Lightning, and then he was with the Stars, uh, and he went from interim head coach uh, starting in December of 2019. Uh, and then took over the head coaching role about a year later. So he's basically been head coach of the Stars for almost two years. So, what's with the NHL? I, I don't know. The same fucking people over and over again. I'm actually it's, gonna. It's, I'm pretty it's sick and tired. It's literally an old boys boys club. It's, it's not. It's gonna so change. fucking stupid. It's fucking ridiculous. They're all friends. It's a big club, and you're not in it. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Coincide- because you're not you know, old. I didn't want to bring that up when talking about Duclair, but that has a lot to fucking do with it. <laughs> I was going to, but I was like, I'll let it go. We're not getting to that point. Oh man, yeah. Oh love it. boy. Um, just uh, <laughs> I need I need to look this up. Um, who? When when was the last um? When was the last time an NHL team had a black head coach? <laughs> I don't think there's ever been one. <laughs> I'm not even gonna look it up. I'm just gonna fucking laugh. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I mean, now, say again, there has I'm, not, I'm not been one. I'm not in one. favor of I'm not in favor of hiring someone just for the color of their skin or a certain you yeah, know it's aspect not even about that they might that. bring it's to the table. Yeah, it's affirmative about, action. Let's get that it's going. It's about again. everything that you can bring to the table. Oh man, you're telling me that um, you know, guys like Rick Bonus, guys like Dave Hackstall, and the same dudes that always seem to get hired here, there, and everywhere that they're better options than uh, you know, than some uh, some Joel other Ward. people that might be out there. You know, Joel Ward uh, is a fucking stand-up coach. He was helping out with the uh, the Ryerson Rams at one point. I think he's, um, he's with Henderson now. Yeah, I was really Absolutely. disappointed that the Sharks didn't get him in their system. Yeah, um, stand-up guy. I had a conversation with him after uh, one of the practices with the Rams, just talking about hockey and just talking about just in general. Great guy, absolute great guy. But yeah, 
I don't agree with the the aspect of having a having a, a guy in a in a position just because of the because he because he looks different in a way um, like affirmative action is what I like to call it. But I I, I don't want that. I don't okay. want to if I if I were a coach and I wanted to be in the NHL and I was and obviously because I'm black, I wouldn't want to get a position and be hailed as like the first guy. I, I get like it's it's like a it's like a trend set. It's like, oh, wow, I'm the first one. That's great. It's like I, that shouldn't be a badge of honor. That should be like a what, what the fuck? Like it should oh. be like a. I, I get what he's saying yeah. in that like how like now from my little brief bit of research here, it looks like the first black head coach in the NHL was Dirk Graham in ninety eight ninety nine, huh. and there hasn't been one since. Wow. Um, which is you know, just uh, it's an entirely different conversation. But again, you know it's. It's the conversation of the old boys club, and it's all yeah. it's all intertwined. I'm just gonna just want to say just a couple things about that. It's that like, it doesn't have to be you know, it's just the fact that that's how hockey culture is. It's it's very hard to kind of get into. Yeah, you have to have money, and then you have to fit the status quo. Those are simple things about hockey culture that are you know, and if you don't you don't want to break outside those lines. That's why that's why there's all the memes, the boring hockey interviews. Every single hockey player has like the same fucking girlfriend. Um, it's all this like, it's it's yeah, and and you know if you're if if there's not those opportunities, no one's gonna help you get into it. No one's gonna welcome you into it. You have to. It, it's almost been like it's almost like golf in a lot of ways. It's that you you have to be almost part of this sub like nearly elite sort of level, and it's finally starting to change now. We're a lot more, you know. Um, underprivileged areas or, you know, stuff like that are being able to run that. But yeah, I mean, if you look at, you know, how things have gone with, you know, s- systemic prejudice and, and stuff like that and why hockey is like it is, is because, yeah. yeah, that's the fucking reason. Yeah. Just to like cap on what I was saying, like, I, I I understand there's a, there's a thing of being like the first and everything, but personally myself, I wouldn't, it's, it's a weird situation. Like the, the look at uh, from like my perspective in a way, I, I would want to be like, oh, being the first is like a great thing. But to me, it would be like, I hate that it took this long for me to be the first in a way. So like to me, like it being hailed as like, oh, you're the first one. Part of me is like, why did it? Why did it have to matter, though? Like, why does my color, my skin have to depend on me being like the first guy or whatever? I'm just doing my job. Like, does that kind of make any sense yeah. in a way? A bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. But you know, I, I, the idea of. Uh, again, like, like I said, that, that's an entire conversation that's that's entwined, right? The idea of, hey, we see seemingly the same people get hired over and over again. The idea of there hasn't been a black coach for, you know, two decades, almost 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, again, the idea of like, oh, wow, the first one was in only in 98, huh? And just it's I, I don't know. So Rick Bonus uh, might be on the chopping block. I'll, I'll end it with that. Um a couple weeks ago, we talked about what might have been viewed as the goal of the year. Uh, last Thursday, the Oilers beat the Jets 2-1 to one in the shootout. Uh, shout out to Stuart Skinner, who got the win. We'll talk more about him in a minute. Nick Ellers scored his fifth of the year for the Jets. But Connor McDavid scored his 11th of the year in what is my goal of the year so far. Now, he only dangled through three people instead of four. And I put four in air quotes because, again, watch that goal against the Rangers. Kevin Rooney didn't do shit. <laughs> like, this goal, to me, was just so much more impressive, man. I, I don't know why. But, again, that McDavid goal against the Rangers, the first thing I noticed is, what the fuck were the defenders doing? This was like, oh, my God. Like, he just he torched Logan Stanley, which people are like, oh, it's Logan Stanley. Well, Patrick Nemeth was the other guy. And, I mean, Nemeth is a solid defense defenseman. But there was, it was something about this goal, man, that I just I, I couldn't believe it. It's, it's my goal of the year right now is McDavid's goal against the Jets. I thought it was unbelievable. I like the shot. It's such a finesse shot that he puts in on the end. It's it's that when he extends out to the forehand and still manages to go like uh like t- to the opposite way that the goalie slot. It's just so good. Like and it, it, it's not like he fires it in there. He just like guides the puck in there, but it floats perfectly in like a perfect so, oh my God, he's it's 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 art. It's absolutely art what he's able to do with the puck, and no one else is able to do it. It's insane. Elite company, uh, in on his own basically. I'm looking back at it right now, just gonna measure just the, the amount of cuts he does, and the deception, and the skating, and his stride is, it's it's unreal. 
Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see skating coaches, um, and like power skating coaches talk about his game for a very long time. I mean, a long time. I think forever. He's basically like the marquee guy when it comes to the like skating coaches and stuff like that. Um, I think the program that he came out of, like it's like PEP, uh, and it's a program like at different various different ranks. That program has exploded with people trying to not like emulate the style, but to learn the secret of how Connor had got has his speed, his exception and all that. And I think just unreal. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask a question uh, earlier is so Connor McDavid has over 600 points in like 400, like 50, 60 games. How long until he hits a thousand? Less. Um, I'm going to say, I mean, so we had that discussion of that graphic that came up about how quickly he continues to progress in terms of scoring goals. Uh, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to track that down. I'm going to say again 250 here, games. I mean, that, I mean that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd say I am trying to see if I can find that, but the bottom, the bottom line is with Connor, it's just, as fast as you think he can hit that number, he can hit it faster and will hit it faster than that. <laughs> it's stupid. It's unreal. It, 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 there's the thought of All that. Right, so I, I found I found the info. So again, uh, zero to one hundred points, ninety two games. One hundred to two hundred was eighty two games. Two hundred to three hundred, sixty eight games. Three to four hundred, sixty seven games. Four to five hundred, sixty four games. And five hundred to six hundred points took him fifty three games. So if, in theory, we can say that it takes him 50 to 60 games to score 100 points, and theoretically, let's just say that he is 400 points away, then, I mean, it's anywhere between 200 and 250. And, yeah, let's go with 224 games, because 224 is my birthday, and why not? <laughs> Connor, make my day. That is um, that's it, wild, though. Just, just... Yeah, he... He will hit, so let, let's say then it's 200 games, right? That's less than four seasons. There is a, and he still has more than half a season to go this year. He's, still, he's only like a fourth of the way through this current season. Yeah. <laughs> he will hit, he'll hit a thousand points probably in the 2023 2024 season. Insane. And he'll that, still that's be like in two, his. That's two years away. <laughs> He'll 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 not even be thirty yet. <laughs> yeah, that's uh -huh. nuts. He's not even he's not even at his peak. That is that's absurd. He's twenty four, right? Or is he twenty five yeah. right now? I he's think 24. he's twenty five now. Um, it's he is he's twenty four. <laughs> yeah, he's twenty four. L he literally has two January. more years until he hits the prototypical prime. Two Mind to three. You. Yeah, mind you as well, he's playing on the Edmonton Oilers. I mean, on Edmonton. Now. Like, if you imagine well, what he could, okay, but what, if you imagine what he could have done on the other team, like with with like a stacked lineup, could he? Though? I mean, I agree. Like, imagine if he was on Tampa. Oh, you know, because like I'm sorry, but I've talked about this. Like, you talk about who he's been surrounded by, and even still, like yes, they're better now. But again, man, that defense still features Duncan Keith, who's cooked, Tyson Berry, who can't play defense, Cody CC, who can kind of play defense, Chris Russell, who can only play defense. Like, their defense is not good, especially with Clefbaum having all of his injury troubles. And then you look at the the forwards, where it's, I mean, right now, yeah, he's with Hyman and Pugliarvi, and they're great. But you look at, like, the depth scoring on the Oilers... I mean, you have, in the bottom six, third line, Warren Fogle, seven points in 17 games. Boy, I bet you wish you still had Ethan Bear. Uh, Ryan McLeod, two points in nine games. Zach Cassian, five points in 13 games. Brendan Perlini, no points in 11 games. Uh, Colton Sevier, one point in eight games. And Kyle Turris, two points in 14 games. Like, the supporting cast is still abysmal. It's just that McDavid and Dreisaitl alongside like McDavid with Hyman and Dreisaitl with uh, Nugent Hopkins, then you're good. Pooley a good recipient of it as well, but then aside from that, oof. Like, I know Oilers fans are still hyped on Yamamoto, and you should be, but he only has five points in 17 games. Yeah. Playing next to fucking Leon Dreisaitl. 
Yeah. Like that supporting cast is still abysmal my, on Edmonton. So I get what Endo's saying. Yeah, my only my only concern is if he was on a team like that is what what happens to his ice time. Cuz there's that fucking pecking order. Like he, he's he would get less ice time. Um he shouldn't, but he would. Um but on the same thing, yeah, maybe you don't need the couple minutes extra per game if you do have guys to pass you like Kucherov and a Braden Point to be your 2C. <laughs> um Fair. <laughs> Jesus. But you know what? I still I still feel like um I still feel like anyone on Tampa is a downgrade over Dreisidel. And I'm so, I'm sorry, Tampa, but Dreisidel's just that good. Maybe Kucherov's I mean, the, the main argument for not. But. If we're speaking to this like heading into this year, I think there would have been more of an argument to say, would you take Braden Point over Leon Dreisidel? Not anymore. Mm-mm. No. Not Absolutely anymore. Absolutely not. Like, the two best players on Edmonton are better than the two best players on any other team in the league. Yes. The team itself might not be as good, that being the Oilers, compared to like a team like Tampa, especially with how Tampa was built last year, you know, before they had to strip some parts away. But yeah, no, the two best players in the league are Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, period. Yeah. And they're on the best team. So do something, for the love of God, I think is what we're all trying to say here. I can't yeah. believe it. Oilers, um, they've had McGretzky, and then they get McDavid, too. Like <laughs> McGretzky? <laughs> Like, go fuck yourselves. Wait, what? <laughs> I think you said McGretzky. No, I and said like, they've had Gretzky and then they oh, get McDavid it's, too. It sounded like Mick Gretzky, and I'm like, oh. yeah, that's what we should be calling him at this point. God. No, he's better than Gretzky. And I'm, I'm going to fucking Ooh. die on that hill. I don't care. He is more talented boop, boop, than boop. Gretzky ever was. I'm not going to say Gretzky isn't the great one, and I'm not going to say he right now is the best player of all time, but Connor McDavid is the most talented player of all time now will he be the greatest will he put up all the points that remains to be seen but i'm i'm i'm, I'm gonna die on the hill that he is the most ho- talented hockey player to ever play the game and the Connor evidence david gets elected to the hall of fame today if he retires. yes yeah like and, and i understand yeah, be some sticklers to, to who'd be like too, well but... we didn't see him fully develop but no i think he gets elected to the hall of Are fame today if he retires me? A guy that talented if, if Connor mcdavid were the suffer uh god bless his heart and his, his ability, like except for like uh, like a like a career ending injury, that man would be a first ballot Hall of Famer. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Not because of his NHL stuff, so, because everything he's done, like on the on the world on the world stage as well with the World Juniors, and I believe he was there. <laughs> I believe he competed in the the what is it the World Hockey Championship, whatever it is. When you don't make the playoffs for the NHL, you go play over there for Canada. Yeah, yeah, and he played on the. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he played on the Spangler Cup team too. Connor McDavid playing on a Spangler Cup team—that is comical. That is hilarious. God. Reminder: It is a Bruins fan, a Leafs fan, and a Sharks fan on this podcast. You could confuse it with an Oilers uh, yeah. fan base here. Yeah. Uh, we'll Holy. wrap up Thursday. The two other games that happened because we could wax poetic about Connor McDavid all day long. Beautiful. Uh, the Blue Jackets beat the Coyotes five four in a shootout. It pushed Arizona to two thirteen and two on the year. Uh, Boone Jenner eighth and ninth of the season uh, for the Coyotes. Uh, shout out to Phil Kessel who scored his third of the year. Lawson Krause is fifth. Um, which is nuts. Uh, Ryan DeSingle finally scored his first goal. Um, I don't want to say finally, but DeSingle scored his first for the Coyotes. Uh, and then the final game on Thursday was the Golden Knights beating the Red Wings 5-2. to um, Actually, no, excuse me, there are two other games, but the Golden Knights beating the Red Wings 5-2 um, because, of course, Vegas can get away with Nick Haig scoring, Paul Cotter, two goals for Zach Whitecloud, and Riley Smith with his six because Vegas is, again, the matter of the injuries, they're almost they're almost getting the Pittsburgh territory, mm-hmm. where you're just like, who the fuck is this, and how are they doing so well? Granted, they're ten and seven, but how how are these guys stepping into this lineup and keeping this team afloat when the amount of injuries would sink most other franchises? It's ridiculous. Um, and for the Red Wings, goals from Giovanni Smith and Joe Valeno, uh, that's a problem for the Red Wings. If you're not getting goals from Larkin, Bertuzzi, and Lucas Raymond. You know, it, it might end up being a bit of a rough night. Like, they need their stars to show up on pretty much a nightly basis. I mean, for for as optimistic as people, as people have been about the Red Wings, the 8-9-2 was the record as of Thursday night after that loss. So, hey, not abysmal, but not too bad. Um, and the final game on Thursday was the Hurricanes beating the Ducks 2-1. to one. Uh, Ethan Bear scored his first of the year, although now I believe he is out after a positive COVID test. So hopefully everything's good there. Uh, Seth Jarvis, though, scored his third of the year in that game. Um, he's played really well. 
you know, it's it's too late, I think, to really throw his name into like, oh yeah, serious Calder candidate. He might be one of the finalist nominees, but it, we it's again, it's Raymond or Cider, unless the, something tragic happens. Uh, and Troy Terry continued that point streak on Thursday. He scored his twelfth of the year, twelve goals as of Thursday. I mean, God, just. The, the point streak did end up ending. We'll talk about it in a minute. But Troy Terry, for the love of God, if he's... People keep wanting us to talk about the Olympics. If he's not on Team USA, I'm going to be so angry. <laughs> like, like, seething. It's... God, just don't be dumb, please. Um, we'll move over to Friday. There were only two games to talk about, which is nice. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks, I didn't know they could do this anymore. They won a hockey game. Uh, they beat the Winnipeg Jets 3-2. to uh, nothing overly notable. Connor Garland scored his fifth. Uh, for the Jets, Ellers got his sixth. Dubois got his tenth. And the Avalanche beat the Kraken 7-3. to three. Don't know if you caught the highlights of this like I did, but oh my god. Seattle just got absolutely destroyed. Uh, both Burkowski and Makar for the Avs are two goal games. Uh, for the Kraken, Everly scored his ninth, ten of his seventh. At least Everly's <sighs> doing good. <laughs> it, yeah, that's like man, the Kraken in general. Ten of his had seven conversation. <laughs> yeah, ten of his seven goals. Well, another yeah. Pittsburgh product. <laughs> the Kraken have been good. Their goaltending has been abysmal. Yeah, and it's funny because this was played against the Avs. Ron Francis done goofs, and in my opinion. His biggest mistake was not, should have taken this guy. Uh, well, I mean, you could say his biggest mistake was not taking Carey Price, although with what we know, Carey wouldn't have been playing right now anyway. Yeah. You could say, oh, I should have taken Tarasenko from St. Louis, <clears throat> which they should have. Holy shit. <laughs> his biggest mistake was going after Philip Grubauer. He had Vanacek, he had Drieger, neither of whom have been great. But Philip Grubauer, at least right now, he has time to turn it around because that contract goes a few years. The decision to bring in Philip Grubauer and thinking that he was, and he could be what he was off of Colorado has completely backfired. Yeah. Because as we talked about in the preseason, I don't think the Kraken defense is that bad. And statistically, the numbers are out there. They haven't been that bad. But Philip Grubauer off of Colorado has been atrocious. And it has completely sunk the Seattle Kraken so far this season. Uh, four twelve and one was the record as of Friday night. Yeah, good good job so. weaponizing your cap space. Uh, you got a gun that <laughs> points right at your face when you try to shoot it. Grats. Do you recall what that deal is? Yeah, for isn't Grubauer? it four by six or a six by four? However Basically, you say yeah. It? yeah. Oh, oh my god, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not more years than that, is it? Five point nine million for six years. Oh. What? Ooh. Why did they give him six years? Ooh. He has. Can we guess in 15 appearances what Philip Grubauer's save percentage is this year? 860. Um, like 840. All right, you guys got to give him a bit more credit. It's an 882 after Whatever. 15 games. Okay. But still, a brand new six-year deal. He had a 922 with the Avs last year in 40 games. He has an 882 in 15 Brutal. so far in Seattle. Yeah, he was a Vesna. Uh, candidate last year. Yep. Yes, he was with uh, Vassie and Flurry. He was the other guy in that uh, conversation. I see why. I, liked Holy. Him. I actually liked him for the Vesna above the other two. Um, I'm also kind of curious why uh, Varlamov was not in the conversation whatsoever, but whatever. Yeah, that one I didn't understand either. Yeah. Well, it's all the coaching. Clearly. Whatever. Well, let's not forget um, Varlamov's a piece of shit. So, yeah. Yeah, right. I, I, I need to read up on that situation again and what happened. <laughs> We won't get into that in this show. Um, we'll move on to Saturday, too. Like I said, there's, there's topics we're going to get to, but we also want to breeze through some of this because, again, there's an extra day worth of stuff to talk about. Uh, the Hurricanes moved to 14-2-0 by beating the Kings 5-4 on Saturday. Uh, Jarvis scored again for his fourth of the year. Aho has eight. Kakanyemi has three. Natchez scored his fourth of the year. Uh, for the Kings, two out of the four goals came from Adrian Kempe, his sixth and seventh on the year. Uh, the Kings very much in that Red Wings territory of being, you know, a, a middle-of-the-road team. But again, tough to beat, not abysmal. The Hurricanes are just a goddamn buzzsaw. Mm -hmm. Again, 14-2-0 as of Saturday. 
Uh, also on Saturday, the Devils beat the Lightning 5-3. to uh, Devils fans everywhere rejoiced as Yegor Sharangovich finally showed up this season on the score sheet. He got his first two goals of the year. Uh, Dawson Mercer is the other guy, I think, that's really competing with Seth Jarvis to be a, a finalist for the Calder this year. He got a sixth of the year. Um, and Also, it, I, it was worth pointing out. Uh, Thomas Tatar, two goals on the year now. Jimmy Vesey has four. Maybe maybe Habs fans were onto something. I don't know. Um, but the highlight of this game, unfortunately, it was more of a low light. Braden Point injured. At first, it was viewed as indefinitely. It was now confirmed today, um, that being Tuesday, that he will be out four to six weeks, I believe, with an upper body injury. He had 13 points in 16 games. That's a bit of a scary injury for the Tampa Bay Lightning yeah. at this point. Because, again, we, we mentioned him earlier when talking about Dreisaitl. There's a lot of people who view Braden uh, Point as the best player on the Tampa Bay Lightning, and I don't think they would necessarily be wrong. Tampa currently sit third in the Atlantic. Uh, if you base it on point percentage, they're in second. So I don't think they're really in danger uh, of missing out too much. I mean, let's be honest. You look at that Atlantic division, right? Uh, Ottawa at the bottom, Montreal, Buffalo, Detroit. I'd be shocked if Detroit makes a wild card spot, right? Like, you're still thinking it's the big four of that division that'll push for wild card spots. And really, between Florida, Tampa, Toronto, and Boston, if any of them miss the playoffs, that is disaster and someone's getting fired. That's where all of them are at at that point. Uh, so for Tampa, you know, you might not be in that much trouble, but, you know, their depth also isn't quite what it used to be, yeah. right? Like, you look at centers right now, and it's Steven Stamkos, still phenomenal. Anthony Sorelli, still really good, despite the broken face. Uh, but then, in the bottom six, it's third-line center on cap friendly right now, Pierre-Edouard Belmar, and fourth-line center, Ross Colton, <laughs> who have a combined five points, each of them playing 17 games so far this year. I mean, I'm I'm intrigued. Belmar was a decent four C a couple years ago. Uh, I would have him around replacement level by this point. But I mean, eh, I mean he's a good system system player. So yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I, need him to play some good defense and some good physical yeah. hockey in that role. Yeah, basically. Yeah, it's it's a rough situation uh, for Tampa, but I mean they'll still be fine. They could squeak into the four spot and then they get to sweep the Leafs in round one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm Again, I'll Ando, it's going I'll, to seven. We all know it's going to seven. You're a bunch of fucking comedians, huh? We all know it's going to seven. You're a bunch of fucking comedians. I'll pimp out the video podcast. I encourage yeah. you for these reactions. It's, <laughs> oh, it's the best. Right. Um, I God, lived with the Florida Panthers for years. God, it'll never end. Dude, you know the um we're approaching like it's it's been over eight years since uh the 2013 collapse and the the choking memes have not died at all. What for Santa like, they Bay? are uh well no for the Leafs oh, against oh, the Bruins. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I've... That was 2013. It is almost 2022. Right. It was 2012 when we had Rivers swept, or was it? Or 14. Shit, I don't remember. Anyway, continue. Sorry. Been a while. Yeah, I, I, Jay, don't worry. We, I can I can also talk about the experience of getting reverse swept. It was it was <laughs> awful. Um, the Florida Panthers on Saturday beat the Minnesota Wild 5-4. to four. Um, Two goals for Frankie Vitrano in that game. He's up to six on the year. Verhage has six. Sam Bennett has six. So uh, Satan confirmed. Uh, for the Wild, though, in the loss, like, Erickson Eck has seven goals. Kaprizov, by the way. Remember when we were talking about Kaprizov not having that many goals? He has five on the year now. Uh, Marcus Foligno with six. Ryan Hartman has nine goals as of Saturday. David Posternock doesn't have nine goals, though, let me tell you. <laughs> My God. Um, that was the Panthers' third win in a row, by the way. Uh, and I believe in this game was when Joe Thornton tied Paul Coffey for 13th all-time in points. He is on 1,531 Mark Recchi is in 12th, ahead of him, just two ahead of him, mm -hmm. at 15.33. So my question to you both, because all three of us have the wonderful experience of seeing Joe Thornton wear our favorite team's uniform, which isn't that weird to say. Joe bit. Thornton, by the end of this year, will likely be 12th all-time, Yep. right? I mean, he's two behind Recchi, so he'll likely be 12th. 
Again, right now he sits at 1,531. Ray Bork is 11th at 1,579. He's I don't think no, Joe catches him. No, he's this is pro. I can't really see him going another year after this. He's really at that level where he's a depth. He's forward. forty-four already. Yeah, he's 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 basically Yager, but he's at that level where he's like a depth player now. Excuse me, he's forty-two. I thought he was forty-four. He's like Yager without the hands, because Yager still has hands. Like now, it's ridiculous. Yeah, Java Jumbo never really had the hands. He used his body to protect the puck, and he'd send insane passes out. But he just he doesn't have the same sort of balance he does, and people are just fast as fuck, boy, and they go around him. And they get to him on the... Uh, you you could question Joe Thornton in his prime how much he'd be able to keep up with someone as fast as, like, Connor McDavid. Yeah. And now even more so at 42 years old, trying to keep up with how fast some of these kids are now. He is sometimes I mean, deceptively on. fast. Like he, on a couple back checks for the Shark, he caught up to someone, like, and would stick lift them. But, like, it's it, it, he just doesn't have... It's not like he could, he could do that and then he's gassed. You know, he's got to take five minutes on the bench. But, I mean, yeah, he was never, never a strong skater. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, he's not going to get there. I don't, I don't think he played, he might, he might try to play another year after this, but it, it, like I said, it's getting to the point where he's really at that replacement level. Uh, like he's a depth yeah. forward now. I think ne- he, next season replacement level. I think he goes, I, come on, Florida, do it, please do the thing. So yeah, I, I can't imagine him catching, yeah. catching Ray Bork, but still he, he'll likely finish 12th all time. In points in NHL history, guy's a future Hall of Famer. I mean, no question. Yeah, obviously he. I don't care that he yeah, doesn't it, have it a cup. Sucks. It's not. Hey, the dream isn't over. The no, it's not. Like the Panthers, the Panthers with that win moved to thirteen two and three. So as much as we talked about, like, oh, they've lost like four in a row after Quinville, you know, got got booted. They're they're still looking good. Yeah, like they are. Like it. And right now, obviously, like as of today. If you had to bet on who's your favorite to make it to the Eastern, you know, Conference Finals, or at least be the guy, the team representing uh, the Eastern Conference in the Cup Final, the favorites right now are Carolina and Florida. And then everyone else is like, okay, these guys still have a shot, but those two are the clear-cut favorites right now. Uh, the champions of through twenty games, so we'll we'll calm down a little bit there. But you get the point. Um, the Penguins on Saturday beat the Toronto Maple Leafs two to nothing. Tristan Jari shutout. Because, my God, uh, Gensel scored his seventh, Carter scored his fourth. Endo, do you have any thoughts on this particular game? Eh, better team won. They wanted it more, so they took the win. Even even Sheldon Keefe said, yeah, they wanted the game more. I don't know what else we could have done. And I looked at, How many I looked, times do you hear that a season as a Leafs fan, though, and how frustrating is that? Well, I mean, is it not wrong? All the games that we've like lost like in a competitive match, it's been like, yeah, the other team wanted it more. Because it's, it's the truth. The Leafs it's can put be out concerning though, because yeah, of course it's concerning. Yeah, I, I just I'm just tired of coping, seething, and mauling because uh, this whole entire thing. It just it's just interesting. They have yeah, so much talent, but no execution. Like even through the Babcock era, it was oh they never start on time. Sometimes they just don't act like they want it. And then this year it was the same thing when jerseys were getting thrown on the ice in Game Four. It just always seems to be that thing of. Sometimes they don't show up. I mean, also the fan base is a bunch of rabid people who desperately just shill out money to go see a team on their performance as well. So I, part of it is on the fans and part of it is on the team as well. I'm not going to like, like, I'm not going to say one isn't worse than the other. Um, I feel like there's an issue with the fan base and how they need to just, you know, I, I get like calming down and I, and I get the perspective of also, having to win a cup and win something or do something because they're basically pissed off. But it's the regular season. Um, I'm pretty sure with this record that we have, we know we're going to get into the playoffs. It just sucks that like these games that we should be winning or should be doing more competitive effort, they don't happen. But that's hockey. Uh, at the end of the day, that's that's the way the sport is. Not Sometimes you'll go out, put your best foot forward, and then you'll lose the game. Also on Saturday, the Canadians beat the Nashville Predators 6-3. to three. Uh, For the Habs, a shout-out to Arturi Lekkanen, who finally got his first of the year. That's concerning. Uh, Dvorak is third. Gallagher only has four. 
Uh, noted medium elite potential, Ryan Paling, second and third of the season. Um, Tyler Toffoli as well also only has four goals. Um, man, we could sit here and dissect this all day long, but I, I don't really understand what's going on in Montreal where the, you know, the guys to really lead that you'd expect to be doing well in terms of putting up points and you know, especially scoring goals, it's, it just hasn't happened. So far this year, I mean, the Habs moved to five thirteen and two with that victory. But I, like I said, I just don't understand how I look at these stat lines, and it's like, yeah, Tyler Toffoli only has four goals. Like the leading scorer on the Habs has four goals, and the guys with four goals this year: Hoffman, Sherratt, Toffoli, Gallagher, Anderson, Suzuki. They all have four. Ryan Hartman has nine. How does Ryan Hartman have nine? He has as many more than freaking Hoffman and goddamn uh, freaking uh, everybody. Like, he's got more than Hoffman and Toffoli combined. Tyler Toffoli scored how many goals last year? Oh, 28 in 52 games. He has he, he was shooting 17% last year. Right now, so far through 20 games, he's shooting seven. I don't understand it. I don't understand it for the Habs. And then on the flip side, for the Preds, he made the Huck community go wild because Matt Duchesne had a hat trick and now has 12 goals. 12! Matt Duchesne has three times as many goals as Tyler Toffoli. What is this reality we're living in? And it's all because I sent Endo that damn jersey. Ride the douche train, baby. Let's go. Let's go. Collectively, collectively, the entire NHL community forgot what a broken mess NHL. Uh, oh, I'm is. so and, fucking and mad got about excited that. about a shiny new card, and oh, that my. is why the game doesn't change. Oh my god, it's so stupid. I, I I I think when people say that Hut has ruined, uh, just to go on a little bit of a tangent on now on the NHL, uh, but just when people say that Hut has ruined NHL, and they say no, it hasn't. This yeah. this event right here has proven that. The community can go complain as much as they want, but their big eight brains go bing, 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 bong, bing when they see like big bong. Yeah, bing, bing, bong, like a big number like this happen. It, it's ridiculous how you people will complain on Twitter or on Reddit like, oh, the game's terrible, it's shit, it's unplayable. But then they'll go out and spend their parents' credit card or money or whatever the fuck they do and just show, just shill out for virtual cards in hopes of getting a Duchesne so you can ride the train and get a and get a big profit when in all reality the game doesn't really matter uh up until gwc when you can actually win money and i think it's hysterical uh, I, get, I get there's like people who aren't competitive in a way but at that same breath you're spending a lot of money that you could be investing in other things instead of giving it to a company who clearly does not i, I get they care but actions speak louder than words and i feel like there's a lot of stuff they need to make up for in this game so any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I could talk. <laughs> I could talk for fucking hours on it and how and what a broken mess it is and how it's completely <laughs> sucked out the fun of content creating. But uh, I'm just I, I don't want to put myself in the headspace right now. So we're gonna we're gonna just move okay. on. Fair. Good point. Um, we'll also talk about then how the Flames beat the Islanders five to two. It was the uh, opener at UBS Arena, uh, which looks gorgeous by the way, and some of the little touches that they've added there for the Islanders, but. Uh, Not a great debut. Mangiapane scored his 13th and 14th on the year. Johnny Goodrow his 7th. For the Islanders, two-goal game for Brock Nelson, 8th and ninth on the year. Mangiapane's unreal. Like, he's just unreal. I, I, again, as much as I can sit here and be like, how the hell are these guys not scoring but Mangiapane is, that would be disrespectful because Mangiapane is sick. And um, he's in a contract year. He's an RFA Good luck. at the end of the year. He's making 2 4 2 5 this year. Um, 10 mil minimum. And it's going to come I back mean, and bite him. Like, if Mikhail Backlund's making 5 3 5, it's a $6 million minimum. And that's for like a two year bridge deal for Mangiapani mm-hmm. to prove it. He's making 6 mil minimum. If it's long term, he's getting north of 9. And if that's nearly a guarantee. And not to mention, uh, again, Kachuk's an RFA at the end of the year. Goodrow's a UFA at the end of the year. Uh, interesting times in Calgary yeah. right now. But I just want to uh, give because... a... Sh- Sorry. No, I thought you were done. 
<laughs> no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I just want to give a shout out. We, were, uh, we weren't sure uh, when we were doing our Pacific uh, predictions where Calgary had kind of fallen things. And I was very critical of uh, Daryl Sutter and his coaching style. Mm -hmm. If he was going to be able to let this team fly. It's working. His defensive style is somehow meshing with an open offensive style as well. And it's showing in their differential, as we mentioned a bit earlier. I waited till now to bring it up, but that's been something that I really wanted to shout out. So I'm more than happy to eat my own words on that one. And I'm good for Calgary because they've been in a weird place for a very long time. And it seems yeah. like they're finally kind of being can be recognized as an actual contender. So uh, good for them. I was going to say, I... I cut you off all, all the time, so feel free to cut me off, too. It's the nature of uh, doing a podcast from the opposite side of the country. But Calgary right now is one of just five teams in the NHL to have over a 700 uh, you know, uh, point percentage, basically. Like, they're a top five team in the NHL right now with Washington, Edmonton, Florida, and Carolina yep. uh, in number one. So, yeah, no, Daryl Sutter's been fantastic. And if this keeps up, uh, yeah, Calgary keeps up at this pace. He, he's likely a Jack Adams finalist this year, and rightfully so, which is ridiculous. This is an we'll example to of Lou the Lou Lamarillo Lamarillo. club working out. Oh, yeah, Lou's going to win. <laughs> the Islanders are going to miss the playoffs, and Lou's going to win. Somehow the coaching award. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, we see, Lou, um, you would have done way better as the coach, so we're going to give you the Jack Adams. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Lou Lamorello for the heart. Who says no? <laughs> Fuck you, Connor. Hartman, because he's the heart man. <laughs> Lou's, Lou's going to outscore. He would have outscored Leon Dreisaitl. So give him the Richard, too. Clean sweep. Lou Breaking Rains news. Clean. First time in NHL history. He wins every award, including the Vesna. <laughs> oh, oh man. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, also on Saturday, the Bruins beat the Flyers 5-2, to two, getting revenge on Martin Jones after Lol. losing to him in one of the first few games of the season. Thank <laughs> fuck. Um, Derek Forward had a two-goal game because, LOL, Craig Smith finally scored. Hey, Craig, thanks. Oh, I wow. love you, but you have one. Yeah, that was Craig Smith's first goal of the year. Oof. Uh, Ryan Hartman has nine. It's <laughs> my go-to. <laughs> also, David Posternock scored his fifth. Ryan Hartman has three more goals than David Posternock and Craig Smith combined. Fuck. Also, Derek Broussard had a two-goal game for the Flyers. He has his third and fourth in the year. David Posternock <laughs> has one more goal than Derek Broussard. Would you like a um, Tomas Hurdle to be your 2C? It'll only cost yes, you three. Yes, please, oh God. God. If only... Krejci can't come back, please. It'll only cost you Jesus. three first-rounders. And I'd do it. Your first I, I would too if I was you, to be honest. Dude, so I would do it. Can, I, I am willing to take the risk on Tomas Hurdle full time. Yeah. I wouldn't be the, the risk of your team drafting three first rounders again. That hey. too. Hey. Um, <laughs> that was long and worth end. it. God, like people are already saying, like, oh, Tuka's probably coming back. Is Krejci coming back? And it's like, I fucking hope so, but probably not. Yeah. But getting Tomas Hurdle and taking the risk, knowing that Bergeron probably has anywhere between 1 and 17 years left in the tank. Who the hell knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd be okay with the Bruins taking the risk on Hurdle to be the guy alongside Pasternak, McAvoy on defense. I honestly think the Bruins are going to have to take a risk like that because otherwise uh, the theory is you, you step back a little bit potentially and then just pass the walk. So I would be perfectly okay with getting the, you know, going all in on Tomas Hurdle. I'd be okay with that. He's really, really um, good. <laughs> he is. It's just the injury troubles, like you yeah. said. But I, I think it's worth the risk for the Bruins, personally. Um, I also want to mention the Flyers fans out there. Uh, while the right team won, holy shit, was there some awful officiating in this game. Just tragic. Uh, there was a face-off where Bergeron accidentally knocked the puck, or maybe on purpose, knocked the puck out of the ref's hand on the face-off, but Giroux got a penalty? Stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. Uh, NHL officiating is trash. Go try to find that clip if you can. It's it's beautiful. Almost it's as bad really as NFL bad. officiating. Yeah. God. Well, God. I think so, the bad, the worst thing about NFL officiating is they're trying to call it by the fucking rule book, and the rule book is awful. Like with all the taunting bullshit. Like I point at someone as I go into the end zone. Dude, the Edwards Alaire penalty. penalty oh where my he points God. at yeah. it. It's an immediate play. Yeah. So the point after is like a fifty yard try. Oh my God. I think the I think the best was um I think one of the 
the a ref like backed his ass up and like hip checked the guy basically. Was, yeah. And then he gives him a it's like, yeah, you contact with the with the official. And it's it like, what are you doing? Taunting. I I don't know. It was it, yeah, it's it was so some, stupid. NFL's fucked. Yeah, no anyway, fun league. The, the Arizona Coyotes won their third game of the year on Saturday. They're three thirteen and two after beating the Red Wings two to one in overtime. Scott Wedgwood single-handedly ruining the Arizona tank. Stop it, sir. It's gonna be traded. Stop it. He's, he's gonna make Deke tap the sign, and then yeah, he's gonna have to get traded. He's, he's the best slash worst waiver pickup I've ever seen. Uh, to just be ruining this team like this, and I'll tell you why. On the New Jersey Devils, Scott Wedgwood uh, played in three games. Technically, suited up for three games. He had an 880 save percentage. In three games, three appearances with the Devils. In six appearances with the Coyotes. Can you guess Wedgwood's save percentage? Like a 950 or some no. shit like that. No, it's going to be 9. I'm going to say 925. 940. What? Yep. How is yeah. that high? He's that Scott good. Scott Wedgwood has a 940 in six appearances on the fucking Coyotes. <laughs> I mean, but okay. Well, how many shots? Yeah, he's probably facing a shit ton of shots per game, though. Oh my god, let me uh, see. So shots. Oh my god, hold on. Let me uh, bring it. So he's faced 182 shots in six appearances, yeah. which comes out to 30 shots a game. That's like average. That's average. not like soup. Is no, I don't think that's average across the NHL. Uh, I think I so. I do wonder what average is. Um, like yeah, 25 I don't know, I don't to know 30. Be able to find that. I guess that's yeah. Fast, that's actually but... less than I thought it would be. I thought it'd be more in the mid 30s. Yeah. So Scott Wedgwood, like I said, is single handedly ruining this tank. It's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also in that game, like Larkin scored his ninth, and it wasn't enough. But yeah, God, man, Coyotes finally win again. Wedgwood's ridiculous. Um, I mentioned too that the Stars had won, and they did on Saturday. They beat the Blues four to one. Uh, Rupe Hintz, fourth and fifth of the year. We talked about how he had a bit of a slow start, but he has heated up a little bit. So is Jamie Benn. He scored his fifth of the year in that one. Uh, Saad got the long goal for the Blues. That was his seventh of the year. Uh, the Golden Knights, like I said, keep finding ways to win. They beat the Jackets 3-2 to two on Saturday with goals from Keegan Kolasar, his first of the year. And a guy. Matthias Janmark, his first of the year. And Riley Smith, his seventh. Uh, for the Jackets, Nyquist, his third. Texier, his sixth. But... Again, Vegas, that that, that pe- the Penguins of the West, as I'm going to call them at this point. It's stupid. But then we get to this game. The Oilers beat the Hawks 5-2. to two. Stuart Skinner gets another win. He has a 2-2 two two record with a 939 save percentage. And Oilers fans are losing their fucking minds. <laughs> and I don't blame them. Like, apparently Mike Smith is going to be out for a little bit of time. Um, and, you know, it could end up being Koskinen and Skinner. Like, Oilers fans have a right to, um, to be, to be excited about Stuart Skinner. Now, I, I've said as much, like, his save percentage in the AHL was tragic. Like, his numbers in the AHL were not good. That doesn't mean that it won't equate to him being a good goalie at the NHL level. But, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's just... I understand it, right? Because we talk about uh, good goaltenders for the Oilers. I want you guys to say stop when I name a goalie that you'd be really comfortable with. <laughs> so these are the Oilers goalies recently. Miko Koskinen. Stop. Stup- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I had to. Keep going. <laughs> Mike Smith. Uh, Anthony Stolarz. Cam Talbot. Uh, was okay for the Oilers, but do you want Cam Talbot to be your starter? No, he's a 1B. Yeah. Laurent Brassois, Al Montoya, Jonas Gustafsson. Endo and I know about Jonas Gustafsson. Oh, fuck that. Um, Anders Nilsson, Richard Bachman, Tyler Buns. <laughs> Vic- <laughs> what a fucking name! BUNZ. Oh. Uh, Victor Faust. Ben yes. Scrivens. Scrivens. I would have been, been comfortable sure. with Fost. I like Fost. I'd be so comfortable with Scrivens. Scrivens was at his like, Scrivens did. Wasn't that against the Sharks that Scrivens had a thousand saves, or was that against the Kings? It was against the Sharks, I think. It was like the 56 save game from Scrivens I'll or look some it up shit. right now. Um, again, to my point, Brzgalov, Dubnik, oh, yeah. LaBarbera, Jan Denis, a cooked Hobby Bullen in 2010 to 2013. Ugh. 
Uh, one game of Martin Gerber. Hey, <laughs> Jeff Delorier. Gerber. You remember Gerber from Matt- that Ottawa run? Gerber. <laughs> Matthew Garon, Dwayne Rollison, UC Markin, and Ty Conklin, Tommy Sot. Like, oh my do you God, not Conklin. get my point of like how fucking bad yeah. the Oilers' goaltending has been for so long did and so to inconsistent? The cup, I mean, yes, and that's what I mean, right? Like, you look back to, like, 06, and it's like, okay, they have the cup run, and then since then, it's been a lot of guys who have shown flashes, but there's been no consistency. No. They haven't had the guy. So I don't blame Oilers fans for getting excited about I'll, four games worth of Stuart Skinner. I'll just say, temper your expectations, because just remember the growing pains that Carter Hart went through, guys. He was really good when he first came up, and then everyone freaked out. And now he's starting to come back. Just don't put unreal expectations on the kid. Even though he's got a call me daddy mustache, he's still a kid. So bring him along slowly. Fair enough. Uh, also in this game, McDavid scored his 12th. Dreisaitl scored his 18th. There was also a moment where the Oilers pinned them in the offensive zone for like five straight minutes because it's the Oilers against the Hawks. Uh, for Chicago, both goals by Debrinket, 10th and 11th of the year. Name him the new captain of the team yes, already. Right, yeah. I will not. I will not give up on that. Um, in the final game on Saturday, the Caps beat the Sharks 4-0. Uh, Samson off the shutout. Sherry, 4th and 5th. Uh, Ovechkin, 13th and 14th. And I, I'd imagine we just move on to Sunday. Yeah, that wasn't even a game. Let's go. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, on Sunday, the Lightning beat the Wild. I don't know if you guys caught this, but like Brian Elliott gave up two goals in like the final two minutes. So they almost blew it, but they ended up winning in a shootout. Yeah. Uh, two-goal game for Sorelli, 5th and 6th. Uh, and then again, for Minnesota, like Felino, seven goals on the year, even though he's more of a defensive forward. Eric Sinek, there's a reason why you keep hearing people say 1C Eric Sinek, because he has eight goals on the year. Uh, and then Kevin Fiala scored his third, but I think he has a good assist total. Uh, the Rangers beat the Sabres. And yes, this is the game with that with that goal. Uh, they won 5-4. to four. Chris Kreider scored his 13th of the year. He's Unbelievable. Uh, Capo Caco, his third, Keandre Miller, his second, but the goal everyone's talking about. Ryan Lindgren, former Bruin, uh, I think came over in the Rick Nash deal to, yeah, by the way, remember when Rick Nash was a Bruin, uh, with, uh, I think 0.7 to go before overtime, Ryan Lindgren gets his second of the year to break the Sabres hearts, um, I mean, for the Sabres, like, you're getting, you know, offensive performances from, like, Osplin, who has five, Thompson, who has six, but... That was the most Buffalo Sabres way to lose a hockey game. Mm-hmm. And that's seemingly the most Rangers way to win one is to scrape by and uh, just get there and then win an OT. It's like, yeah, I mean, I was I was looking at all their wins like of today and it's just like one goal games, one goal games, <laughs> like in a lot of the recent ones. So yeah, there you can see. I mean, it's exciting hockey, but yeah, I, I wonder if that's going to be sustainable. Something's got to give either way for the Rangers. They got to either get that ratio better or they're going to start losing games. The Calgary Flames beat the Boston Bruins uh, four to nothing, much like Sin. I don't even recall this. Um, Dan Vladar gets a shutout win Lol. in his return to Boston. Darth Vader. My only gripe with that is people were calling it a revenge <laughs> game. There isn't a person on the planet who would have kept Dan Vladar over Jeremy Swayman. Yeah, you could you could disagree with the idea of bringing in Allmark. But then you would have been going into the season with two technically rookie goaltenders in Swayman and Vladar. That just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So what did the Bruins do? They gave Vladar a chance to go. Instead of being the third guy, he's at least the backup to Markstrom. And he's been great. Yeah. And in general, like also from this game, Goodrow scored his eighth. Mangiapane his fucking 15th. Um, Hannafin also scored his first. It was the Flames' third win in a row. They're 11-3-5. and five. Out of their 11 wins on the year, seven of them have been shutouts, by the way. Seven of their 11 wins so far this year have been shutouts. It's ridiculous. And uh, apologies for the pronunciation here, but this came from Corey. I believe it's Masisak Masisak on Twitter. Um, The Calgary Flames' total and abject destruction of the Eastern Conference is one of the weirdest, most uh, slash probably random things in recent NHL memory. They are 11-1-2 against the East with nine of their wins being by three or more goals, but they are 0-2-3 against the Western Conference. <laughs> so <laughs> if Calgary makes it to the cup final, it's a sweep. Yeah. It's over. If they do, this they what we're suck seeing. in the West, though. 
<laughs> oh, my God. And from Sportsnet stats, Calgary became the first NHL team since forward passes were allowed uh, in 1929 to record seven shutouts within the first 19 games of a season. Daryl Sutter. Daryl Sutter. But, yeah, it was at the Bruins' expense, so nobody cares. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also on Sunday, the Leafs beat the Islanders 3 to nothing. Joseph Wall, second career game, 23 years old, gets the shutout. Marner scored his fifth and sixth. Kasha scored his fifth. I want to talk about that really quickly because... Number one, Mitch Martin has really woken up over the past couple weeks. Woke. But Andre Kasha scoring his fifth of the year, man. This is what the Bruins fan base was hoping from him, and he just couldn't stay healthy. And I think that's what every Leafs fan expects. It's just like, God, let this guy stay healthy because he's sick when he's healthy. He's just very rarely healthy, but so far so good for the Leafs. I got an autographed puck for Andre Kasha. Hey, I mean, it's a Ducks puck, but <laughs> it's autographed by Kasha. Let's go. There you go. You want it to be a Sharks puck where he's like, sorry, I <laughs> filled your net. Never. No, I, will, I want a Mike Hoffman autographed Sharks puck. That's the one. <laughs> um, Endo, so your thoughts on the game before we talk about the other things that we have in our notes here. Okay, so. About uh, the specific game. Just okay. your thoughts on the game, not some of the ambiance, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, Joseph Wall, he played really well. Uh, I think that was definitely wall. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, he played. He played very competently, and he looked like he can play at that NHL level. As some, we get back, some up. might say that, that was the job well done. Two okay, swear to God, I will quit this podcast <laughs> live on the freaking air. <laughs> I mean, I, like in all seriousness, I mean, he did he really play like a brick wall. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> I'm tired of this. You know what? Uh, I think he really cemented himself as a uh, as as the backup goalie for the Leafs right now, especially with Mrazek out. And I think he set up a good foundation for him in the future. I just hope that. Uh, the Leaf fan base doesn't come through like a wrecking ball and smash him down uh, if he makes a mistake, which this this fan base has had a history of absolutely ruining goaltender confidence uh, with just lamenting them for any little minor mistake. But I feel like this was definitely like the game where he basically cemented himself as like the guy for the future for the Leafs. Now fingers crossed everything goes well and Mrazek comes back but now this gives brings up opportunity if you're going to keep him up uh when Mrazek gets healthy and have him around as like a third goalie uh similar to what they did with McElhenney uh when they had when they had him for a bit and they had the three goalies in the system I, I think this will be um interesting it's an interesting career path uh, career path what the hell am I talking about it's an interesting future for him and I'm glad he was able to get that shutty yeah Rebar. Um, I want to mention, too, <laughs> from the New York Islanders' perspective, now, first and foremost, they are 0-2 in their new barn. They have lost six games in a row. They have a 5-8-2 and two record. That is concerning. Pain for And shame. how soon does the conversation come up of what type of change do they have to make there? Because I think everyone knows, like, the even just the thought of, like, moving on from Barry Trotz could be viewed as a massive mistake. And by the way, if you're the Seattle Kraken and Barry Trotz get let's go, you know, he, he moves on from the Islanders, you kick Dave Haxtall out that door as fast as you possibly yeah. can. My God. Trotz is the only one who could save Grubauer. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. The most notable thing about this game, though, uh, at least the most talked about, was not the Joe Wall shutout. It was the Islanders fan base booing the hell out of John Tavares again. On one hand... Death taxes and the Islanders fans booing Tavares. <laughs> on one hand, <laughs> you can understand some frustrations and that you have to wonder if John Tavares was still an Islander at some point over the last two years if they could have made it to a cup final, if not one. Again, stifled by Tampa twice in a row. John Tavares on that team, he might have been the difference maker to get them there. On the other hand, Jesus Christ, get the fuck over it. Yeah. It's like you wait to get the window with your ex, or it's like it's like middle school when like you see like someone you hate, and you're like, "Boo, I hate you." Yeah, 
Yeah, I fucking hate you. Yeah, remember. Remember I hate you. Like, like that kind of thing. And I think it's just... Oh, like, it's, ch it's childish. It's, like, get the fuck over it. People get traded. People want to leave and go to other places. That's the sport. You, you, guys will dr you guys will trade a guy to drop up a hat and be like, yeah, okay, whatever, cool. But the minute he wants to go somewhere else in free agency, you guys freak out? What the hell? I, I think the X comparison's pretty pretty spot on, to be honest. Like, yeah, especially if your the ex idea was like, like, "I'm never gonna leave you," and then leaves you, because that's kind of what yeah. happened. Um, it's but a I Taylor mean, Swift song. What? Also, it's on the fucking management to build a team around him, which they literally never did in in uh, yeah. Long Island. So, yeah, I, yeah. I see both sides. But I mean, it. yeah, I mean, I, I just think at, at the end of the day, you got to look at it as like, you know, be appreciative for what you have. Like, you can look at John Tavares and say, oh, what would have been had we stayed together? But on the flip side of it, like, the Islanders have landed on their feet. Look at what you have. You have a team that's made it to back-to-back -back conference finals. You have a team that, granted, they're underperforming now, but can still be viewed as a legitimate contender if they make the playoffs. Like, be appreciative for what you have instead of focusing yep. on what could have been. Yep. Thanksgiving. Be know. thankful. And then <laughs> run at 12 a.m. to go steal a TV off of some guy who has, like, two kids and a wife. Love it. <laughs> Gotta love it. Black Friday. Use promo code 2 Check out. Got it. Got it Black <laughs> Friday. Oh, man. Oh, God. Um, the other games that we have to talk about probably won't be as fun from uh, Sunday. But the Hawks beat the Canucks because, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Vancouver uh, won nothing. Mark Lol. andre Fleury shut out. Brandon Hagel scored his fifth of the year. Brandon Hagel has as many goals as David Pasternak. I don't even know who Brandon <sighs> Hagel is, but uh, congrats. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then, like, obviously, like, again, for the Hawks, they'll be happy to be at 6-10-2, given how bad the start of this year was. For the Canucks, they're 6-11-2, and, and everyone's miserable. Pedersen's essentially talking about confidence issues, which is not helping. And they still haven't fucking done anything. Travis Green is there. Bim Jennings is still there. Holy shit, Vancouver. Like, my God. We yeah. we first started talking two weeks ago about them making changes, and still nothing. Everything's good. Don't worry about it. God, I, don't, I was going to say, I, I just feel like anything we could talk about with Vancouver would be a retread, so I'll move on unless you guys got yeah, something. No, but they're an ostrich buried with their head buried in the sand. Fair enough. Uh, the Seattle Kraken got their fifth win in franchise history. They're 5-12-1. Big uh, tug of the shirt collar there. Uh, they did beat the 11-3-5 Capitals, though. They beat them 5-2, to two, pretty convincingly. Uh, McCann, his seventh. Schwartz, his fourth. Jaden Schwartz had a fucking awesome goal in that game, too. Uh, Calle Arncroke finally got his first of the year. Oh, yeah. That's a problem. Yanni Gord, his fifth. For the Caps, Ovechkin, his 15th of the season. So, Ovi's still unreal, but... Uh, Good for Seattle to actually get some stops yeah. for once. Imagine. Look at what can happen when that... Uh, what, what, I was <laughs> going to say, was that Grubauer in net or was it Dreger? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up, to be honest, because I don't recall. I didn't mark that down. Uh, but that was from Sunday. And in goal for that, it was Grubauer. Okay. Hey. Grub. He's eating up. That's how he went from uh, 8... You know, eight, yeah, eight, from 860 eight to, <laughs> to 882 so or whatever. See, I, I was right. 86. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, and the final game on Sunday, the Coyotes won their fourth of the year. Stop it. In fairness, I think it was Pamelka <laughs> in goal for this one. Still, they have two uh, goaltenders doing unreal things. It's hilarious. They beat the Kings 2-1. to one. Uh, God, Travis Boyd is third of the year. Kyle Capobianco scored his second for the OT winner. Uh -oh. uh, Brendan Lemieux, the lone goal um, for the Kings. I just... Has as many goals as God. Pasternak. Uh, he won fewer, thank God. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. About time Brendan Lemieux has as many goals as David Foster. Oh, my God. I'm done. I'm oh, done. Man. Just, just quickly, um, one second. Just, yo, boy. Go ahead. <laughs> yo, boy. Yo boy. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, for the Coyotes, uh, we talked about the Wedgwood 940. Vimelka has a 905. Um, oh, and he's actually play. been their, their primary guy. He has 13 appearances. In those 13 appearances, he's faced 349 shots. So he's also facing about 26, 27 shots a game. So it's nothing too crazy. But the problem was for them, 
Uh, again, Ivan Prosvetov, one game at an 821, and then Hutton played three games and had a 741. So they've gotten some decent goaltending as of late, thank God. Uh, that'll bring us on to Monday, which we'll try to uh, round out through here relatively quickly. Uh, we'll get to the the biggest talking points, though. Uh, the Jackets beat the Sabres 7-4. to Jack Rosovich finally on the board, his first two goals of the year. Same for Gavrikov, though, who's more of a defensive defenseman, so Rosovich needs to find that goal-scoring touch a bit more. Uh, Bjorkstrand, his sixth. Domi only got his second of the year, too. So, I mean, the Blue Jackets are a 10-6. If some of those other guys can heat up in terms of goal scoring, they'll be looking pretty good. Uh, for the Sabres, Tage Thompson, two more goals, 7th uh, and 8th of the year. But the Sabres have lost three in a row. They're down to 7-9-2 and two after that really hot start to the season, and nobody is surprised. No. I, would imagine. <laughs> I, I literally predicted this. Like, we were like, it, like, I'm just like, it's it's kind of funny to watch again and again. Like, this is like, what, three years in a row where they've had a hot start, maybe even four, where they've had a good start, and then they just completely start to melt down. And lo and behold, two games below 500 in reg, and I'd consider that starting to melt down from starting out like 4-0 or something like that they did. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd call that fair. Uh, the St. Louis Blues did beat the Golden Knights 5-2, to two, so the Golden Knights' luck kind of ran out. Uh, Ryan O'Reilly got his third of the year, stuff like that. Brandon Saad has eight, so does Riley Smith for the Golden Knights. Uh, the Nashville Predators beat the Anaheim Ducks 3-2. to two. Shout out to Ryan Johansson, who has six goals, more than David. He has one more goal than David Pasternak. Um, Ricardo Raquel has as many goals as David Pasternak with five, but this was the end of Troy Terry's point streak Aww. at 16. Just a sad, sad day, huh? Uh, time to trade them. Game points. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, trade tra- to the Bruins. Yeah. Um, for peanuts. Team that'll value him. Let's go. Yeah, just you know, let's. Uh, you, you gotta, you gotta move on every once in a while. Once you know someone starts to <laughs> starts to struggle like that. Um, interesting one to note here too: the Colorado Avalanche beat the Ottawa Senators seven to five. Yeesh. Figure that one out. Yeah. It was the Sens' first uh, game back after those uh, cancellations due to COVID. It was a two-goal performance for Kale McCarr. He's up to seven. Rantanen's up to seven. Nazem Kadri scored his sixth. He has a nine-game point streak. 19 points in those nine games on a line with Valeria Nachushkin and Andre Burakovsky. So, uh, Good for him. Boy, Endo, if only he uh, could avoid getting suspended in the uh, postseason. Huh? If he only wasn't an idiot, then, you know, he'd be fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the only reason why he let, he was like out of the Toronto because he kept taking po- like all those like all those like calls in the postseason and just in general. He like if you can control Nazem Kadri, which appears the Avalanche have a little bit, he, he can be a star player. He can be like your top guy that you can rely on. But when you can't, then just he, there's nothing you can do. Honestly, I bet it was carbs that was getting to him. And now McKinnon doesn't let him eat pasta, and he's you know straight as an arrow. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, also in that game, shout out to Zach Zamford for the Sabers. He had a hat trick, up to five goals on the year now. Uh, he's been a really good pickup actually for them, and in, in my opinion, at least compared to what they had from Logan Brown. Uh, I think I said for the Sabers for the Sens there. Uh, and Josh Norris update: seven goals on the year now. Nope, for Josh Norris. But uh, it was the Avs' fifth win in a row. So they went from 4-5-1 and one to 9-5-1. and one. And since Nathan McKinnon's injury, they have averaged 6.2 goals for per game, including scoring seven goals on three occasions. I don't even know like, how that's fucking possible. I don't either. It's so stupid. That team is stupid good, and I just hope like hell they actually get by Vegas and stop beating themselves up. Because goddamn, they, yeah. they should have they done it last year. They melted down, man. But that's mm-hmm. what I, that's again that's the the playoff mindset where it favors the teams that aren't necessarily skilled who just get away with all kinds of bullshit. The playoff and, uh, sigma grind. Vegas set. is one of those teams, like a St. Louis Blues team. Like, I, it's not really fair to I guess call it out a team from like ten years ago, but like it was the Flyers around that time, the Bruins around that time. Who were those teams that were were just beat you the fuck up in the playoffs but i mean that was kind of how the game was I'm, like, in, in this case now a, a team like the avalanche should demolish you know in vegas but you know we'll see yeah not wrong the pittsburgh penguins beat the winnipeg jets three to one on monday tristan jari had a shutout streak that lasted for 161 <laughs> minutes 
Penns fan asked this question. Thoughts on the Penguins' perfect road trip in Canada and Jari's shutout streak? Uh, nobody talked about Jari's shutout streak outside of Pittsburgh unless you were playing the Penguins because nobody paid attention. I hadn't heard about it at all. I did. Uh, and I think it's for the sole fact that it's, you know, Tristan Jari is still trying to repair his reputation after last playoffs meltdown. I, I think that's what it comes down to. But that was very impressive. Again, 161 minutes of uh, of hockey without allowing a goal. Yeah. So. Yeah, thoughts on the road trip? Don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't I I <laughs> to be as rude uh, and and brash as possible. No, hats off to him. Um, did they get rid of their goal their goaltending coach in the off season, or did they keep him? I believe they did. Yeah, so that's a clear effect as to why. Uh, I think his glove hand has gotten a lot better. I've I've looked at his game a lot too, and yeah, things gotten better too. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> that's that that's it. Congrats, uh, Tristan. I was going to call him Christian. Uh, Tristan Jari. Uh, but don't come back to Canada. Please. I want my boys to win and not have to worry about you getting another shutout. 4 4 4. So, again, the Pens, uh, the perfect road trip, three in a row. Uh, shout out to like, Jason Zicker, four goals, Heinen, six. Gensel has eight now, so he's heated up, too, after a bit of a slow start. And the final game on Monday, the final game we'll talk about here to round up this podcast, it was the San Jose Sharks beating the Carolina Hurricanes 2-1 to in overtime, ending a Canes four-game win streak. Uh, for the Hurricanes, Tony D'Angelo scored his fourth. Again, he's kept quiet, and that's good news for everybody. Uh, but LeBanc, his third. And a Mr. Leafs legend, Barabanov, with his third of the year for the OT winner. Sin, your thoughts on this game to uh, to round out our show here. Yeah, um, Timo Meyer and Eric Carlson did not it, uh, get on the scoring sheet, but they were a massive game changer throughout that game. I'm going to keep saying Timo Meyer is having a phenomenal season. He just has found his groove. He's got the points to show for it, but his impact is coming in bigger ways, too, where he's actually using his body, like not just throwing his weight around, but using his body with the way he skates with it. He'll protect the puck, kind of like Hurdle-esque in that way. But yeah, Hurdle got the assist on the uh, on the game winner, which was, well, it wasn't quite a power play goal. It was just as the power play expired. It was a carryover from the end of the third period. By the way, the Sharks finally got a power play for them with 30 seconds left in that game. So it was literally 180 and a half minutes since they got, had gotten a power play, which is fucking stupid. Um, there was a questionable hit in that one where Barabanov earlier got hit in the head by a Niederreiter. Um, I, I usually do this. I send the, I send the video out to my uh, my friend who's not a Sharks fan. I'm like, what do you think about this hit? He said Barabanov kind of, you know, it looked more like Niederreiter was trying to like brace himself and he did kind of extend upwards, but it was a reverse hit, hit situation. Either way, even if it was egregious, it's not going to get looked at. Again, I'm going to say it one more time. It has been since uh, December 16th of 2016 since a player has been suspended uh, for an offense committed against the Sharks. So we know it's not going to get looked at. Um, coincidentally, since George Peros took over. Weird. It's not like he played oh. for the, one of the Sharks' biggest rivals, got his ass kicked by Ryan Clow or anything. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a solid game. It was a gutsy win, and it's a it's a team that's hovering around 500, like the Sharks, a bubble team playing an elite contender. And what we talk about about all these kind of teams that are seemingly making the switch, they're staying in it. They're hard to play against. They're hard to beat. They 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 got the job done, and you know they worked their asses off for it. They could not get a call the entire game once again, but they stuck with it and got the win in OT. And I'll take it. It was. It was a good uh, team effort, and again, against one of the better teams in the NHL, and hell yeah. Yeah. So with that, everybody, we'll look to uh, wind things down on this particular show. Uh, a very busy day on the schedule for Wednesday. Again, no games on Thursday, and then Friday we'll be back with the show and probably talk about some of the games that are in progress for that one because, of course, it's Black Friday. There's a lot of afternoon games there. There's only three games tonight, one of which already started. Shout out to the Lightning who scored on their first shot against the Flyers. <laughs> of uh, course. The Blackhawks play the Flames, so congrats to Calgary for losing to a Western Conference team for <laughs> some reason. Uh, and the Oilers play the Stars tonight, and this came out from Sportsnet Stats. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl has 16 points in his last 15 games against the Dallas Stars. So congrats to Leon Dreisaitl on a hat trick tonight against Dallas. That could get Rick Bonus fired. Who's to say? Um, but yeah, damn. Endo, plug your stuff, man. Uh, hi, I'm Endo. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, Twitch, uh, YouTube, uh, Endo Mills. That's where I'm at. That's where you can find me. And yeah, that's me. 
Sinski. Yeah, and you can find me on Twitter at SinFTWProd and on YouTube and occasionally Twitch at SinFTWProductions. That's Sin for the win. Fantastic. And, of course, I am everywhere at Tukey24. You can catch me in the morning slash afternoon on Twitch, at least for this week, maybe for the rest of the year, maybe for the rest of time. Who's to say I'm trying to be a normal person for a little bit? Can you imagine that? Ew. Uh, but with that said, again, we'll see you all on Friday. For those of you in the United States, have a good Thanksgiving on Thursday. And uh, to the rest of you, don't die Black Friday shopping on Friday. Freaking wait until Cyber Monday. You'll get the same deals, and you don't have to leave your house. It's awesome. Yeah. It's fantastic. We'll see you all after the holiday. Goodbye. 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 Bye-bye.